Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, Story Time. I was a park facility officer in a backcountry park. This park is super isolated. We worked alone for eight day shifts, and I would go days without seeing anyone during my eight day shifts at the start of the season. It's much busier now, but at the time, I'd actually ration my visits to the lighthouse to once per shift since they'd be my only human interaction sometimes, and I didn't want to burn them out on me. Lol from the cabin, I had binoculars that allowed me to scan the beach in case campers arrived, and I'd go check their camping tags. One evening, I was scanning the beach, and I had to do a double take. It wasn't the normal wolves, sea lions, elk, deer. Nope. It was a large group of nudists. I felt like a weird voyeur, so I put down the binos and hoped if I gave them an hour or two, they'd want to put on clothes due to the ridiculous swarms of mosquitoes. Nope. That was fun checking their tags. I also had campers come report a dead, murdered, body that had washed up on shore on one of the other beaches in the park. It was really awful for those poor campers. I had to organize the police to come out and retrieve the body. It had been at sea for some time. I'm a park ranger, and for this story, I'll call myself Ranger J. I work in an area of one of America's most famous national parks. I graduated college with an outdoor recreation degree and then entered the park service as a seasonal employee for many years before becoming a full-time permanent employee. It was about 80 degrees, with a clear night sky, and we had just finished our first training session for new seasonals at the ranger station. It was a bunch of new people, and we got the mandatory training out of the way, so we were all free to go home. Most employees lived near the park, But there were five other people who lived several miles away from the RMNP's main entrance gate that night, alone. The park has one large dirt road that traverses through it called the Trail Ridge Road. It's very scenic, very beautiful, and only about five miles up from the ranger station. At this time of year, there's no snow on the ground yet, so it's perfect for four-wheel drive or decent-sized trucks to come up and down. So. I took one of the guys with me who lived in town back to his car that he had left on Trail Ridge Road. We drove down, and it was right around 9 p.m. The park was now closed, so there were no visitors around. As we pulled up to one scenic outlook called the Forest Canyon Overlook, I noticed something moving on a hiking trail right below us. It was about 30 feet down from where we were. I had my window rolled down, and there was this horrifying, ear-shattering scream echoing off the canyon walls. The hairs on my neck stood straight up just thinking about it. This was not a human noise. I'm a hundred percent positive after hearing it. It sounded like a mix between an ape and a large bear, and possibly a giant bird. I've never heard anything like it in my life. I don't know what the new guy who was with me thought, but he didn't say anything afterward. As we pulled away, there were two other rangers sitting in their patrol cars about 40 feet behind us. They were facing away from us. I asked them what they thought it was. I couldn't make out any words, but one of the rangers pointed behind me towards where we saw something walking on the trail below us. So, I turned my light bar off, stopped my truck, and got out with the spotlight to see if I could spot anything. By this time, The rangers had gotten out of their cars and were shining their lights with me, but we couldn't see anything. I didn't know what to make of it. I was kind of freaked out at this point, so I decided to go down to where I saw something walking on the trail below us. All the other rangers stayed back. I got out of my truck and started making my way down the closed road with a large 4 million candle spotlight that I carry in my truck to see at night. This way, I can see when I'm patrolling off-road. I didn't go far before I noticed something moving on this rock wall about 30 feet up from me. I took a pic of it and hoped that if I could zoom in on it later, I could see what it was. As I took the picture, 
something let out another one of those ear-shattering screams and started moving up and down the rock wall like a monkey would swing through trees. At this point, there was nothing but sheer terror going through my mind. So, I got back to my car, stopped at one of the rangers' cars, and told the rangers that we've got a real problem here. They lit up their spotlights while pointing out, and I saw something moving. We all scanned that area with our lights but did not see anything move or sway in the trees or bushes nearby. After a couple of moments, we didn't see anything anymore. So, I got back into my truck, and I showed them the picture I had taken. The ranger on the left took one look and said, that's a devil dog. I don't even know what that means after hearing that, but my thoughts were confirmed. Whatever it was, we were not looking at any ordinary animal, that's for sure. It's 2004, around 3 am. My family and I are preparing for a road trip to the Grand Canyon, we live in SoCal. Everything is getting packed away in the kitchen, and I'm asked to take out the garbage. I walk outside. It's the kind of darkness when it's too early for morning but too late for night, and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans are located on the side of the house in the backyard, halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk when I look over towards the gate. That's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes, but it was the smoothest and roundest head I've ever seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first, I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape the same height as the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and into the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was 14 at the time and just stood there, waiting for more movement or sound. After about a minute, yeah, I waited, of not hearing anything, I stepped backwards until I was able to sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. Okay. So Friday at 1.28 am, my friends and I decided to go for a drive. We sometimes like to go to the mountains to experience something that only happens in that area, paranormal and supernatural. Like any other time we do this, we go in my car and drive past Home Hill, heading towards the mountains. We park across from VHS, about a mile and a half away, then we sit and take in the scenic beauty of the dark desert. We start by listening closely to anything and looking everywhere, being hyper-observant. At first, we saw a light in the distance traveling flat on the desert land, getting within about a mile away from us, then disappearing altogether. Moving on from where we had, I mean, I just see something else driving through roads and flying by at least 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. We turned down a familiar road. This is where we knew that something was about to change. Me and everyone else looked to the right side of the car, and we all saw what we believed to be something like a skinwalker, a massive black dog just hunched over at my car. While I was going 45 miles an hour through the road, we should have felt the impact from the massive creature, but we didn't. Both people in the back seat looked and saw this thing rise up from the ground and stand straight up on two legs, absolutely huge and all black with red eyes that are forever imprinted in my mind. I didn't slow down but sped up, going about 55 miles an hour now, so probably about 20 yards away. They saw it rise up as if nothing happened to it. I received a telephone call from a woman whom I will refer to as a Y. When a Y was growing up in the 1970s, she would spend a lot of her time with her aunt who lived in the northeast suburbs of Detroit. The neighborhood had many acres of woodland, as well as old dilapidated properties that were covered in vegetation. 
A few hundred yards behind her aunt's home were old abandoned houses that attracted the attention of many of the kids in the neighborhood. The kids would talk about the hairy guy who spent a lot of time in one of the large abandoned buildings. A.Y. was curious so she accompanied some of the kids into the woods. Sure enough, as they stood near the house, they would occasionally see the hairy guy look out of the large broken window on the first floor. They were scared to go into the house and investigate, but they were also fascinated by the hairy guy. A.Y. described the face as that of a caveman with a wide flat nose. The hair was black and stringy. There had been talk in the area for many years of a huge hairy creature that would be seen roaming the neighborhood at night, but nobody ever seemed to get a good look at this thing. In the winter of 2016, A.Y. was living in her aunt's old house, which she moved into after her aunt passed. She was returning home from work when she noticed that several people were gathered around what appeared to be a multi-car accident at the end of the street. There was a lot of ice and snow on the road, so she figured that may have been the reason for the accident. But as she looked closer, the first thing she noticed was that one of the cars was literally upside down and teetering on the heavy branches of a large oak tree. Another car looked like it had been tossed into the adjacent bushes. She walked over to the scene and listened to one of the drivers, her neighbor, attempt to explain to the police officer that this big hairy man walked out in front of me. I scared it and it got really mad. I jumped out of the car and ran into the house. As she watched from the window of her house, the hairy creature picked up the small car and tossed it into the oak tree. Then it pushed a parked car into a yew bush and then flipped it on its side. The police seemed to think the woman was either impaired or crazy, but A had thought back to the hairy guy in the woods. As she walked back to her house, she soon noticed a trail of huge footprints in the snow along the side leading to the woods in the back. She took a few photos of the tracks, but she didn't say anything to anyone other than her nephew who told A why that it was a Bigfoot. A is positive that is was the same creature she saw when she was a girl. Her nephew has been setting trail cams for the past three years, but he has been unable to capture any photographic evidence. The abandoned houses in the woods had since been razed. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature or even spirit possibly, just a few nights ago, and I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer to just what I had seen. I suppose I will start with the story now. It happened just a few nights ago when I was biking home from work. I work the closing shifts for my local Walgreens, so I get off work around 10.30. I live only 30 minutes away by bike from my job, but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights, so it's always pitch black when I'm going home. Well, about 5 minutes into the bike ride going home, I hit the beginning of where the street lights ended and darkness began, and like I always do, I pull out my phone and turn on the flashlight option so I can illuminate my way home. Well, only a few seconds after I turned it on, I tilted it up more and froze because I saw this tall, skinny pale looking figure for a brief second before it fell onto all fours and, like the wind, was gone into the woods. Shortly after, I started to pedal as fast as I could because I had no clue what it was that I had seen. When I heard a low screech and whatever it was keeping pace with me hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly and didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later, I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles, as if someone was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just off the pan blueberry waffles or pancakes, which didn't make sense to me as there are no buildings in the area where that scent was. So I figured perhaps whatever it was I had seen was possibly using scents to try to draw me into the fields or woods. Now I do know a few areas around the trail are supposedly haunted. There's a dinner theater that's not too far from it, and a supposed haunted water tower in the area as well, and a couple of other places. But no matter what I think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. It couldn't be a deer because I have talked to people around the area and no one's seen a deer ever in the area, and besides, it was standing on two feet when I saw it, like it was a humanoid.
It couldn't have been any other wildlife because the only wildlife I have spotted are squirrels and birds. But I figured I would share my experience and see if anyone has had something similar or may know a possible rationalized explanation for what I could have seen. This is going to be pretty long, so I apologize for that. I'm trying to include as much information as I can. As far as I know, the creature has never tried harming me, but it has oftentimes made me feel unsafe and threatened. As the years have passed, I began paying less mind to it and just putting the feeling in the back of my mind. January 2012, I bought a horse and began boarding it at a very old barn. It was a small, tight-knit, friendly barn community not far from my home. It had been around since the 60s, surrounded by woods. There were three barns, the main arena was entirely surrounded by thick woods, and there were small trails in the woods behind the property. Fast forward to June 2012, I had two horses there now. I was there every single day without fail, 2 p.m. 10 p.m. I fed the horses and cared for them. I rode one every night as well, mainly in the arena, but sometimes in the barnyard. There were no field or arena lights, just the moon and stars. One evening, around 5 p.m., I was sitting on her, letting her stand when she started snorting and backing up. I looked up and saw this white or gray creature crawling out of the woods towards us. It had a very small round head, its eyes were just pits. It had a very small mouth, not much detail there. Its arms were very long and thin, fingers also like that. Its rib cage was very pronounced and defined, and its legs were long and lanky. Its movements were very jerky, not smooth and fluid. It slowly jerked out to us, when my horse turned and bolted out of the arena. She's a dead broke, calm, well manners horse who never spooked before this. Stubborn old mare, but not spooky. She would not go back into the arena that night. I walked her around the barnyard, staying near the main barn, put her up, and ran out to peek into the arena, to find nothing except some footprints where I saw the thing. Throughout the summer, I saw it peeking, almost dancing, around the gate that lead into the woods where the trails were. One night roughly a month later, at about 9 p.m., I was riding that horse again in a front pasture. The moon is full and bright, and I look to my left to see the creature running full spread by my side on the other side of the fence, I slowed my horse to a stop and it took off around the corner and behind the side barn into the woods. I continued seeing it, mainly in the woods, but it was always around. Summer 2013, the barn shut down when the owner died. We moved the horses to a friend's place for the time being, and I didn't see it there. Late summer, fall 2013, I found a new barn. Woods directly behind the barn and arena. This place had lights and was much newer. About a month later, when I was getting ready to leave I heard something in the woods, I looked down the barn all into the woods and saw the creature running down the road into the woods. I saw it much less frequently for a while, until later in fall 2014 I began seeing it in the back pastures woods, it darted in and out of the tree line. I saw a second one sitting in a neighbor's yard, it would sit in the same spot every day and watch me ride. Started taking pictures, which are very poor and crappy, and sent them to a friend who claimed he and some others have seen it. Kept seeing it occasionally, but from a much greater distance than at the first barn. I went with this barn owner to another farm to get some stuff, when I saw a very very large version of this creature run out from the woods, right behind a tree I was 10 feet from, while I was alone by the trailer. Last November, a house sat for the barn owners. I went out around 2 am to fill water troughs and enjoy the full moon and cool night. I was sitting in the back pasture when three of the creatures began coming from the woods, one came up to the trees near the trough where I was, the other two were walking along the tree line. The horses were silently munching their hay, pretty far from where the creatures were. I messaged the guy from earlier and told him what was going on. Since that incident, I haven't really seen them. Last summer, I did see one outside my house staring into the windows. A few weeks ago, 
One was outside my bedroom windows tapping and making a strange faint shrieking sound. This was a lot to type out, but I hope someone reads this and helps me figure this out some more. I'm very open and willing to discuss more paranormal things that have happened with this, my friends experiences with this, and anything else that could or could not be connected to this thing. Pennsylvania had many reported paranormal phenomena from ghosts to UFO sightings occurring for decades. The state is even home to several famous cryptids such as Bigfoot, Mothman, Goatman along with a few visitation by the New Jersey Devil. One of the lesser known and probably the most pitiful of creatures believed to inhabit the northern western woods of Pennsylvania is the squonk. The squonk is a legendary animal believed to live within the hemlock forests in the northwestern part of the state. They are described timid and ugly in appearance as the creature's skin is sagging while covered with moles and warts. Legends claim the squonk is constantly weeping because it's ashamed of its body and will often try to avoid being seen. This creature is said to have a unique ability to escape capture from hunters by dissolving completely into a pool of tears and bubbles when cornered. One well-known story about a captured squonk told in Pennsylvania involves a man named J.T. Wentling. Sometime in the early 1900s, the creature's skin was valuable and Mr. Wentling went out hunting for one. One night with a full moon, he tracked the animal down by following the glistening trail made from its tears. Upon sighting the squonk, Mr. Wentling coaxed it into a bag by imitating the creature's weeping under a hemlock tree. While carried his prize home, he suddenly noticed that the bag was lighter, and on opening it, found nothing inside but tears and bubbles. This may be the source of their scientific name, Lacrima corpus dissolvens, from the Latin words for dissolving body. The legend of the squonk has been spoken in Pennsylvania since the early 19th century with the first written account made in book by William T. Cox called Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods with a few desert and mountain beasts, 1910. Lumberjacks and hunters were mainly the source of early sightings of the creature. Several cryptozoologists theorized the squonk may be resulted from encounters with malformed wild boars within the time period as there are no new accounts of the creature reported. Essentially myself and another guy had received pellet guns for Christmas a few days earlier, and we were out in the woods above our parents' houses screwing around with them before dinner. It was about 4 p.m., the light was starting to fade, but there was still really good visibility under the canopy of trees. We'd been out there for a few minutes when the other guy went up on a ridge just out of the wooded area for a bit, and I stood on the trail just inside the woods trying to unjam my pellet gun. I heard a twig snap, looked up, and this thing walked casually, purposefully, between bunches of trees about 75 feet in front of me. As it passed in front of me it turned its head and looked right at me, but it made no other sign of altering course, aggression, or anything else. Just stared at me and kept walking until it was out of sight behind the overgrowth. As can probably be expected, I lost my shit and ran out of there as fast as I could. For years, literally years afterward I was plagued with the feeling that I was being watched in the woods. My bedroom window faced the woods, and I'd lie there at night turned away, feeling, knowing, that if I looked at the window there'd be something looking in at me. Whenever I walked anywhere near where I'd seen it, my chest would zeets up without me realizing what was going on, and it'd be hard to breathe. The weirdest part is that I'd get tears in my eyes, tears streaming down my face like I was crying, but I wouldn't be sobbing, no runny nose. The things that stick out to me, burned into my brain. It was tall, probably 7 feet or more, it was skinny, almost emaciated looking, and had an oddly shaped face. The face looked almost like a squished, yet smoothed out, monkey's face that too small for the head. It was medium gray in color, and either smooth or with very short hair, and the eyes were black. It had a long, black nail the length of a steak knife sticking from each finger, and kept the fingers curled slightly to keep them bunched up while it walked. It was not trying to hide, seemed unconcerned that I was there, 
and made no attempt to come closer to me or to get away. It just turned its head as it passed in front of me, and looked directly at me as it walked. I don't talk to a lot of people about it, but I've heard anecdotes, unsolicited, that indicate the thing's been seen by a bunch of other people in my hometown too, people well outside my social circles. To be clear here I don't believe in God, Jesus, or demonic possession. I don't believe in mutants, escaped government experiments, the Bilderbergs, conspiracies, Morgulians, or that vaccines cause autism, and I think that while there's probably alien life out there, I very strongly doubt it's coming to earth to peep in windows and scare the shit out of teenagers walking through the woods in their remote ass hometown. I don't know what the hell it is, but it sure was a bizarre encounter. It doesn't seem to have actually harmed anyone or anything. And it's been around for most of my life if the reports are true, so who knows what it's up to. I don't expect anyone to believe this. I don't blame you if you don't, sometimes I'm not sure I believe it myself. Regardless, it is 100% true. I was driving in the woods years ago. It was a pretty familiar area, to this day I can drive to the exact spot it happened. It was summer and I drive a convertible, so the top was down. Maybe somewhere around 2 am ish. It was a very clear night, but it had stormed earlier, not really relevant, just trying to give as much detail as I can. On the horizon of the right side of my car, I see flashes of amber light in the distance. At first I thought it was an emergency vehicle, but I know the area well, and there was no road where the lights were coming from nothing but woods for miles, in fact. I almost crashed the car trying to figure out the lights, there was a tree down in the road that I almost hit from the storm earlier. I have to stop the car and turn around, it's a two-lane road with no lights nearby whatsoever. Nothing but starlight and my headlights. As I turn my car around, in the middle of the road, my headlights land on this thing, I guess. Whatever it is, it was 8 feet tall at least, at least that's my best guess, it was much taller than me at 6 feet. I stopped the car, why I did so, I couldn't tell you, I don't know myself. But I did, and shut the lights off, and this thing, it was definitely humanoid, and definitely not human, had some sort of luminescence about it. Its skin glowed a dull, white light. The thing started to move towards the car, Ad was making terrible noises. Hoarse, moaning noises, that's the best way I see a described the sound it made. As it got closer I could make out its features, I wear glasses and my prescription is very outdated. I know, bad idea driving at night like that, but anyway. Again it was very tall, and very very thin. I remember thinking if it was human it would have starved to death long ago. Its arms were out of proportion, as was its neck, they were abnormally long, its arms were nearly to its knees. It had wrinkled, worn, leathery looking skin, which was the purest white I had ever seen. The wrinkles of its skin made it look impossibly old, it folded over itself and over again. The best way to describe it would be looking like some combination of maggot, birch bark, and wet newspaper. Like if you cut your finger, and wear a bandage way too long, and you take the bandage off and the skin is sickly white and wrinkled. That, but everywhere. The closer it got, I could see more, its eyes, or apparent lack thereof. They just looked like large, deep, dark holes. Its mouth was crooked and way too wide, if it had ears, the corners of the mouth would be right up to them. PHS moaning, limping, Shuffling thing came too close for comfort finally, and I had seen enough. I started my car and took the nope train right out of there. I drove 90 all the way home. In hindsight I regret leaving. I had the strong impression, after the fact, that the thing was injured or sick or even dying. It did not look well, and whatever it was, I think perhaps it only wanted help. In hindsight I hoped it had found help or had at least come to a swift end, as it was obviously suffering. A little bit of background, this was in southwest Michigan, and myself, I have been employed in the past as a paramilitary contractor, 
which means I have had plenty of psych evaluations mandatory for the job. I am perfectly sane except for chronic insomnia, and I absolutely do not do drugs other than cigarettes and the very occasional beer. Anyway, this is my story. Like I said, I don't expect you to believe it, but it is the honest truth. I guess I just really want to know what this thing was, if anyone has seen anything similar, hell, it's been a few years and it's one of those stories you tell when the subject of high strangeness comes up. In my late teens to my 30s I would frequently go ghost hunting with my friends. This particular incident happened around 1998 and my idea of ghost hunting was going into creepy places and looking for ghosts. No equipment and no plans. Just us being stupid. We rarely even remembered to bring flashlights. The group consisted of myself and my three best friends, one of whom had brought along his girlfriend who in turn brought along her best friend. The six of us had begun investigating on an old abandoned and very unsafe creepy barn and hence succeeded in nothing more than freaking out the two girls. One of my friends suggested an old ruin we knew of so we went back to check it out. We arrived at the old ruin which was out in the middle nowhere in Southern California's high desert at exactly midnight. The guys all got out of the truck. The girls refused to get out. We immediately spread out. The three other guys moved off to their right to explore the perimeter of the property while I headed straight for the ruin. The ruin was easily identifiable by the light of the full moon. All that remained were three foot tall cinder block and rebar outline of a building on a slightly raised cement slab surrounded by rubble. It hadn't been a large building by the look of it having a short central hall with two rooms on either side. No sooner do I step foot on the threshold of the building do I look up and see something. The best way I can describe this thing is when you take black and white play dough and mix it together into a streaked, vaguely humanoid shaped golem with a round head. I watched this thing, visible only from the waist up, glide smoothly from left to right just outside the far side of the ruin. As it reached the far end of the building I calmly did an about face and walked back to the truck. I wasn't scared. I didn't panic. Until recently, I just accepted simply that the sight of this thing had just overloaded my mind and my understanding of the world and had simply seen enough. As I reached the truck I realized that both girls were gazing past me towards the ruins with eyes the size of saucers. Though there was nothing there when I turned around both girls in unison described the exact same thing I had seen and claimed it was standing in the exact same spot on the threshold where I had just been when I saw it. There's not much else to say except the girls and I waited in the truck until the others back came. I've been to a lot of cemeteries in and around Albany, New York. I've been to the Pinewood Cemetery the most, every time I've experienced something paranormal. There's another cemetery on that side of the Hudson River in Winnenskill that had directions on what to do when you get there and what I saw was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. A post on the internet said something like walk into the cemetery and walk up the grass hill to the back right, turn around and you will see what you're going to see. If you look away you won't see it again. We did that and there was what looked like a black transparent dress between three trees and waving like it was in the wind. There was no wind. Surrounded by what I'd describe as black beer bags scattering like a a swarm of bees or something. We watched for a few minutes then looked at each other and it was gone. I am going to start off by saying that this post is completely legitimate. This is not fiction. This is something real that I have experienced. My hope for sharing this experience on the internet is that I can find someone else who has witnessed the same thing as me. Or something similar. As I have been searching for answers for years. Also, maybe someone can give me some insight on what this could be. I don't expect anyone to truly believe what I'm writing. I know it is unbelievable. But I know my truth. This experience is something that changed my life completely. Also would like to note that during my life I have had lots of paranormal and spiritual experiences. I don't consider myself a religious person, but I believe in God. 
I've witnessed too many miracles and things not to believe. When I had this experience I was 18, I am now 22. One night, years ago I was hanging out with my now ex-boyfriend. It was either November or December of 2019. We decided that night that we wanted to look at the stars. It was very cold out and probably around 1 am, but that did never stop us from going outside. We put on extra layers, grabbed a blanket and laid out to look at the stars. Most of the night we were having fun, laughing and taking. There was one point where our conversation got very serious. He started explaining to me that he didn't believe in God. Or anything at all. He believes nothing will happen when we die. My response to that was I respect his beliefs but I believe in God. I know something will happen when we die. I've witnessed too many spiritual things in my life not to believe. I've always had a knowing that something more is out there. His only response was once he sees something, he'll believe it. We were quiet for a while after that, but eventually continued talking about other things and having fun. That's when I saw something in the sky. What I saw was a massive pair of wings gliding directly above me. It was at least 18 to 20 feet. I couldn't make out a head, legs, or tail. Just a massive pair of wings. It was dark and hard to see but the wings had a subtle glow just enough for me to see it. It almost looked see-through but also glowing. Can't be for sure though. It was a shocking thing to see. I wasn't necessarily horrified, but I was in complete awe. I didn't feel anything negative. My ex wasn't paying attention at first. I shouted at him to look up. When he did, he immediately started panicking. He was swearing and freaking out. The pair of wings wasn't there for long. It just flew above us, then above my house and seemed to disappear or just faded into the darkness. As it was flying, it only flapped its wings once. So really it was gliding. My ex had grabbed me and insisted we go inside. He was horrified. We didn't get much sleep that night. Eventually, the next day after calming down, we decided we wanted to go out at night again and see if anything else happens. There was a lot more that happened, I won't get into too much detail about. We saw strange UFOs and two big bright lights that appeared to be close to us. So bright that it was hard to see. That itself was very scary and unusual. But the strangest thing was the winged being or thing. After this happened my perspective of life changed completely. There is so much out there that we don't know about. Not that it's related, but weird things started happening around the world too. Covid, Ukraine, Chinese spy balloon, so much more. There is just so much happening. I have searched and talked to so many people to see if maybe they experienced something similar but I can't find much information. I do believe that maybe what I saw was an angel. Or could be an interdenominational being. I'm not sure. I don't think I'll ever know for sure. I've accepted that. Again, as unbelievable as it sounds, this is something real that has happened to me, and my ex-boyfriend. Feel free to tell me your thoughts. Hopefully this reaches someone who witnessed something similar. February 25, 2016, it was a normal day and the sun was going down. I was home one night, and both my mother and stepfather were home too. I assumed they were asleep. I let the dog in the backyard. I noticed it was a little warmer than usual out. Also, it was a pretty clear sky, so I went out back to stargaze. While I was outside I felt something in the air. Some sort of static buzz, I felt it in my stomach and it felt like my bones were vibrating. I followed the feeling and looked over the fence to see where it was coming from. I couldn't believe my eyes, it was a triangular UFO craft landing on the street in front of my house. I couldn't tell if the craft had legs or not. It had orange, purple, blue, green, red, and white lights on it. I remember thinking that it was weird nobody on my street was seeing it. I saw a door open on the craft that formed a ramp that touched the street. Baffled and babbling I went inside and as I rushed to the kitchen sink I said to myself, it's not real you're just crazy. It's not real you're just crazy. 
I washed my face with some cold water and looked out of the window above the kitchen sink. I saw a little girl in an old school pink dress with blonde hair. I estimated her age at about 5 to 7 years old and she was holding the hand of a shadow person leaving the craft with her. I couldn't see any details of the silhouette she was holding the hand off or inside the craft due to the bright white light. I thought it was weird how I could see the details of the girl but not the other thing. As I saw this, I heard a little girl's voice say Luke. Come with me. Daddy. It's so good to see you daddy. Don't you want to come with me? But it was said inside my mind. I went from baffled and babbling to terrified and panicked to the highest degree. I left the kitchen, ran slash, and stumbled into the living room. The voice of the little girl died down. I began wondering if I was having a nightmare. I looked at the time, it was 10.33. I then thought to myself, if I was dreaming, how could I possibly know the time? I felt an approaching presence. I slowly turned around and saw a silhouette of the shadow type man at the front door. If you could call that thing a man. I could see it through the foggy glass of the front door that still had Valentine's Day decorations on it. It had long spidery fingers that it deliberately flaunted. As if it knew what I was seeing through the mind. It began to laugh but not out loud, in my head. As it did I saw its mouth open and close like when a cartoon character laughs. I was shaking and trembling. I immediately tried to plan a route to my mom's room but I decided on a shortcut that would lead me through the fireplace to the left of me and into my mom and stepdad's room. I ran to the double-sided fireplace. And as I started crawling on my hands and knees I heard it tell me you won't escape, we've taken you many times before and there is nothing you can do. I looked at my ash-covered arms as I tried to continue to crawl through the fireplace. I looked into my mom's room. My mother and stepfather were both lying in bed on their backs but with their heads facing me. Their eyes were screaming. It was like they both were having sleep paralysis. The dark voice said, they can't help you, they are frozen. Then I heard the buzzing in the air turn into rumbling and I heard a chant that sounded like the chant of a dead language, Zim Ma Bu Ea It Er. The chant was very repetitive, and the same syllables were chanted over and over. As the rumble intensified a white light was washing over everything. I tried to move but as it grew stronger, I grew weaker. It became so loud and so bright I was blind and deaf, overloaded by too much light and too much sound. Everything went white. I woke up in what seemed like a half second later. Face down and tongue out on my bed, shoes on and fully clothed. My boots were on my pillow, Almost as if whoever took me didn't know that it was for my head so they placed me on my bed backwards and face down. I sat up in shock. I ran into the bathroom to check on myself in the mirror. I opened my mouth and saw that my tongue was cracked, dehydrated, and dry. It was like a dead man's decaying tongue. I could peel pieces of skin off it, it was so dry. I washed my mouth with water until it was hydrated enough for me to talk. I remember, sitting there in front of the mirror for a second, thinking about what happened. I remember thinking how do I explain something like this. I broke down and began crying hysterically. What made it worse was if that little girl was my daughter, would I ever see her again? Would I ever get to know her? Is she safe? Is she okay? I don't even know her name. How do I find closure in knowing a daughter I never knew I had is out there without me? and with whatever took me. How do I move on from knowing that I'll never get to see her grow up? How do I cope knowing I can't reach her, and I can't help her? I practically fell downstairs to tell my mom and stepdad what happened. I knocked on their door and my stepdad answered. I was babbling, shaking, and crying the story out of my mouth. But it made no difference because my stepdad said last night, I don't know what you're talking about. He closed the door. I sat on the couch in the living room and quietly cried as I questioned my sanity. It was 5.55 am. Are you familiar with the Custer Battlefield in Montana? Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. Just to put things in perspective, I'm 65 years old now. 
This took place in the early 90s and I used to, I don't do it so much anymore, I used to have a Dodge van and on vacation time I would always throw a futon in the back of it, a sleeping bag, my Coleman camping stuff and I'd hit the road for two or three weeks and go visit places. One trip I went back east, I'm from back east. I'm from Ohio. And I've been in Monterey now for the last 40 years. And I visited Civil War battlefields, Antietam, Gettysburg, Harper's Ferry and on one trip I went up to see Custer's Mountain up there in Montana, and where it is, it's up there in the prairies and it's surrounded by a lot of mountains. It is small. It's on. The intersection of State 90 and US Route 212 which goes east and west. It's a little east of Billings, Montana. And 212 starts at 90 and runs right behind Custer's Hill and goes to Spearfish, Sturgis, Deadwood, you know, that part of the country. Anyway, so I've been on the road for 4 or 5 days already on this trip and I'm tired and I need to take a shower or jump in a river, someplace. I get to the park at 8 o'clock at night. It's already closed so I'm not going to go in and see the monument that night. I was also really hungry. Now down where this was at is this little general store that has a cafe in it. So I pulled in the parking lot right there and they were getting ready to close. It was this guy and his wife and the guy was a retired park ranger who used to take out tours of the monument and he knew it really well. And his wife was Native American and she lived there with her whole family for generations. And you know after the battle the Native Americans just didn't go away. They all still live around there in the following generations. Anyway, so they make me something to eat. And I asked them if they happened to have a beer I could drink and they said no they said go up the road a couple miles to this little town called Crow Agency, buy a 12 pack, bring it back and we'll help you drink it. So I did that. I went up there and got a 12 pack and I brought it back and for the next couple hours they told me the true story of Custer's battle and it was really riveting. Parts of the story you never heard of. It wasn't like Errol Flynn dying on the hill like in the movies, it was a long, drawn out battle, and it was multifaceted. There were other parts of the battle. Other sections of the battle. Anyway, they were getting ready to close up. They had to go home. I asked them if I could camp out in their parking lot. They said no, I couldn't do that but there is a little access road off route 212 about a mile down the road and it's a dirt road and due to maintenance of the park, you can pull into that spot, and nobody will bother you. I said, that's great. I went down the road. I found the spot, backed into it, and turned off the van. It was dark, starry and it was quiet and it was just out here in the prairies. It wasn't eerie at all. It was just neat, right? and it was dark and it was starry. So I rolled back into my sleeping bag and I went to sleep and I was out like a light. So it must have been a couple hours later, I'm sleeping, I guess I'm sleeping. Maybe I'm dreaming. I'm hearing this noise, back of my mind, small, ethereal. I hear men shouting. I'm hearing horses. I'm hearing gunshots. I'm laying there thinking I gotta be dreaming this. You know how you're in our EM sleep? you can't move, right? And it comes and it's going and it's fading and it's coming back. And it's getting louder. Now I'm waking up and I'm hearing this. You know how you wake up to a bad dream and you go, oh my god, that was a bad dream and it goes away? This didn't go away. It's getting louder. I'm hearing this. I'm looking at my hands. I'm awake. I'm hearing this. What is this? I throw open the side doors of the van. I jump out and there's nothing. There's nothing. It's dark. It's starry and a little cool and it's still going on. Horses and gunshots and men. I'm hearing this. Then it just started fading away. And then it was gone. The whole episode probably lasted three minutes. The whole rest of the night, I crawled back in the van. I sat there wrapped in my sleeping bag completely spooked. The next day I went and visited the park and then I left but that night it was weird. I'd just like to say that I am not making anything up. All of this 100% happened. I find it somewhat therapeutic to share information like this. 
Generally, people aren't very kind and I have been laughed at and called deplorable things for sharing accounts like this. I feel these types of things are important to share so that other people who have things like this happen to them would feel less like an outcast. I am on the bashful side of the personality spectrum so I am definitely not seeking attention. My parents were from a small Mississippi town that has had many UFO sightings, heavy paranormal activity, cryptid sightings, and general strangeness. Maybe this has something to do with what I have been experiencing 40 miles away, in a heavily populated area that doesn't have a single snooze hour in its operation. I don't fancy the idea of this high strangeness following me but I don't know how else to describe it. It followed me, or should I say, us. My parents moved to the city sometime in the mid-1990s and years later, I was born. The first experience I'd like to share happened around January 2012, I was attending an extracurricular mentoring program at a school, and there were hundreds of people there. We, the students were assigned seats and the names of our mentors were taped to a chair in each row. Unfortunately, my group's mentor wasn't there so peers started to get up and wander around. I didn't. I just sat there and vaguely looked in the direction of the mentor speaking in front of me out of boredom. He was talking to my classmates in the row in front of me. He was their mentor. He wore glasses and had almost icy blue eyes. I was just looking in his direction and I saw this man's eye change into a vertical pupil. Like a slit, reptilian-like. I still don't believe I saw that, but why would he get nervous after that happened? He peeped at me from the corner of his eye while still addressing the students in front of me. It was a slit pupil. It was still blue but the pupil was vertical. I kind of did a double take and slightly frowned in confusion at why I saw that. What confirmed it was that he got nervous after this. I don't think anyone else saw it or they did and they were like me, utterly shocked and confused. Maybe he wasn't expecting me to notice because he had glasses on. Why would he look at me while his eyes like that? Perhaps an involuntary shapeshift? I'm an open-minded person, however, I still take a lot of things I hear on the internet with a grain of salt until I actually experience it. Did I see what people call a reptilian shapeshifter? Why would he take an interest in mentoring a bunch of human teenagers? I don't know. What I do know is, it was not normal and if it wasn't for the hundreds of people in the auditorium, I would have run out of there. It's not creepy because he was non-human. It's creepy because he was masquerading as a human so we wouldn't suspect anything. For the most part, I've just sort of brushed off these experiences but at times, they can become intense. In the midsummer of 2012, I was lying in bed and watching the TV. Literally out of nowhere, I got this vibe from the window as if someone was staring at me. It felt horrible. My mind was telling me to run but I just laid there in bed. I turned the TV up to cut through the feeling that had built up in my room. I faked a laugh at what I was watching on TV because I knew something was staring at me from the window at this point. In my mind, I thought that my laughing would trick whatever was out there into thinking I wasn't paying attention to the horrible vibe it was giving off, pretending as if I didn't know it was there. Right after I faked laughing, whatever it was started to tap at the window. Loudly. These were solid tap-tap like it was letting me know that I didn't fool it. The tapping was hard enough to make the window shake a little. It would scrape at the window screen as well. I could not jump out of bed and down the hall to the bathroom quick enough. I stood there in the bathroom absolutely terrified. I had to lean against my vanity to keep my legs from giving out from trembling. I sat there for about a good 20 minutes half expecting to see something peep around the corner into the bathroom at me and half contemplating to go sleep with my parents. I really didn't want to wake them but I felt if I had gone back in my room that night, something bad was going to happen to me. I slept with my parents that night. It is actually hilarious when I think about it now, a giant teenager nestled between her parents in a bed. Wasn't funny while this was happening though. I was scared out of my mind. They asked me what was wrong and I just said, I was going to camp out with them that night. I was not about to go back into that room and get abducted, eaten, or whatever. Screw that. In all seriousness, no way that was a physical person. 
My room is on the second story of a house surrounded by an eight-foot wooden, deadbolt fence at the end of a yard. No way it was a bird because birds are not usually active at 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning. Plus, birds, the species around here, beaks are too small to make a noise like that. It was definitely not a squirrel. I tried to recreate the noise the next day with my nails on the window and I could not. My nails sounded too dull against the glass. I'm 99% certain it was not an animal either. It seemed too intelligent and could taunt. We still live in the same house in the same heavily populated area. I don't know where it could have come from or where it could have gone. I'm going to be honest, the tapping at the window sounded like it came from something with developed claws. If I had to guess digits, maybe 2 to 5. The vibe this being gave off was not a good one and this is exactly why I do not sit out in the backyard at night in my garden anymore and I make sure to lock my window before the sun goes down. I'd like to note that this tapping on the window incident happened two times over two summers. One time in July of 2011 and the other more aggressive one, in July of 2012. The one from 2011 wasn't as loud or intimidating as the latter one. I haven't experienced it after these two years. Nevertheless, high strangeness still occurs. Around late June of this year, however, I was woken at 4 am by this scrubbing sound followed by a thack sound against the walls near my room from outside. It went up the wall to the ceiling and back down and towards the window. I do not know what that was. A misguided squirrel or bird? Highly unlikely. This next experience, 2012, happened at night, again, I was lying in bed watching the TV. Then there was this hissing that started coming from the window. It was faint but definitely there. I was not imagining it. I still get creeped out by this, it puts me in a trance. I was staring at the window in a trance and I could not move. When the hissing stopped, I regained my senses. It's happened multiple times. I don't like that something can have control over my locomotion like that. It continued to happen throughout the years. Just last year around September, I was taking a shower and out of nowhere, there was this loud hiss that originated in one of the corners of the shower followed by a ringing tone in my left ear. I jumped because of how loud the hissing was. I'm a bit more relaxed now but still very cautious when I take a shower. It is very uncomfortable to be aware of something that may be watching me bathe. In March of 2013, I was lying in bed with my eyes closed. I was not sleeping but I was at the going to sleep state if that makes sense. It was broad daylight but all I felt like doing was laying down to sleep. In this state, laying in bed, eyes closed, I felt like I was being sucked through some sort of tunnel. I was conscious of myself in the bed but I was going somewhere else too. I was completely immobile and could feel this tingling sensation all over. At the end of this tunnel, I could see a room. But before I reached this room I started to pull myself back. There was an instinctive nope reaction on my part and I started to pull myself back. When I made it back, I immediately got up. I'm not sure what that was about. I also heard a voice during this incident in a monotone say something along the lines of, how can you believe in extraterrestrials and God? I know, it seems so corny but that's what it sounded like it said. I am not sure why, whoever it was, would say something like that. In 2014, this is very embarrassing for me and might be TMI but I feel I need to share it. I started having this feeling in my private area equivalent to a large object forcing its way inside of me. It got to the point where it was disabling, and very painful and it hurt to walk. It was a sore, throbbing pain. This would happen out of nowhere. I'd be sitting on the couch, instant pain. Laying down, instant pain. I checked myself and could not find out what the problem was. This was around the same time when I had to go to my pediatrician because of the irregular cycles I was having. I would not have a cycle for 5 months at a time. No injuries, no hormonal irregularities. Nothing. They could not find out what was wrong with me. And then, in October of 2014, I had a dream, I'm sure it was a recollection of some sort, where I was in this brightly lit room. 
I had no clothes on and I could not see where this light was coming from nor could I see anything else. I felt very dazed. I felt my hand being grabbed and guided toward this room that had a back stretcher type chair in it. It looked like the thing elderly people used to help their backs but silver in color with this sort of rim going around the top of it. Again, I hope this is making sense because I cannot draw. I was placed in this chair. The next thing I remember is having this needle being inserted into my right upper arm. I watched as the needle was placed there and I felt no pain. I couldn't see who grabbed my hand nor could I see who placed the needle in my arm. I was then shown a screen on the wall in front of me where I saw my abdominal organs. I've never seen anything like that before. I woke up to a very itchy right arm that I scratched so hard, I made a sore. That had never happened before. It still itches occasionally. The very next day after this dream, this life form appeared in my bathtub drain. I am not making this up. It seemed to be some type of fungi but it reacted to water touching it and had tendrils that swayed in the water. I was honestly creeped by it. I don't know what the heck it was. I still beat myself up for not filming it when I first saw it poking about 6 inches up out of the drain. I didn't want to get close to it and decided to start showering in my parents bathroom instead until it went away. It did but it came back in 2017 and seemed to have changed its shape or it may be a different life form altogether. It appeared more ruffle like with holes in it but it stayed curled up in the drain instead of poking out. Again, everything I just typed is 100% true. I have nothing to gain for sharing my accounts other than the hope of helping others feel less like outcasts because of their experiences. A few months ago, I was on a hike in the state forest and ended up on one of the rural roads in the area. I found an abandoned house and took a look around. When I came out, some guy was across the street, eyeing me. I told him I was just taking a look, I definitely look like a hiker. He was cool, and we ended up shooting the breeze for a while. At one point, he brings up messing with kids at night. If he sees kids parked out on one of the roads or partying near his house, he literally makes urban legend come to life. The dude sneaks out at night and bangs on trees. He's my hero. On April 11, 2012, I received a call from the man who, along with his girlfriend, had a frightening encounter with a strange creature on November 20, 2011 outside of Troy in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. The fellow told me that what they saw scared the hell out of us. I was able to interview the woman involved on April 26, 2012. After conducting extensive interviews with the driver and his girlfriend I learned the following details. At about 11 to 5 p.m. that evening, they were driving onto Mud Creek Road traveling west towards Highway 14 near Troy. As they continued down the dark road, their attention was drawn to the left side of the roadway. The man, who was the driver, saw some movement and mentioned it to his friend. The woman initially thought that a naked man was crawling on the side of the road. The driver decreased his speed, swerved his truck in the middle of the road and directed the high beams of his headlights towards the subject. The driver stopped about 30 to 40 feet away. They soon realized that this was not a person but instead a creature that was crawling very low to the ground. As they watched, the creature moved into a squatting position with its back completely straight, somewhat like the stance of a kangaroo. The arms of the creature were held tightly to its body. What looked like long claws that resembled the talons of an eagle were easily visible. The claws were estimated to be about 8 to 10 inches in length. One claw was shorter than the other three. The creature had a muscular body. The head of the beast appeared to be oversized and shaped like that of a wolf. At the top of its head were two pointed bat-like ears that looked to be about 4 to 6 inches long. The entire creature, according to the man, was covered with dull wrinkly dark black skin. The man described seeing large canine-like teeth in its mouth. The eyes of the creature were about the size of a silver dollar and were shiny black. The man stated that even though he had his high beams directed at the creature, 
The eyes did not reflect at all. The man said he looked over the body during the 12 seconds encounter, and for some reason thought the creature should have wings, but none were apparent. In the squatted position, the creature seemed to be about 5 feet tall. At this point, the creature was in the left lane of the road and about 1 to 2 feet onto the pavement. As the couple watched in amazement, the creature began to stretch its body. The man said that at this point the animal started to stand up on its back legs while also falling over onto its front feet. The driver said that in this position, the creature seemed to be about 6 to 7 feet tall. The animal then fell over on all four legs. The witnesses observed that the front claws of the creature was now 2 feet across the center line of the highway, while the back feet remain 1-2 feet from the edge of the road. The creature then turns its head to the right and looked towards the vehicle. The driver told me that it looked directly at them, with a horrific expression, like it was panicked. The fellow saw it take a deep breath. He had the feeling that the creature didn't realize that it was being observed and when it realized it was it was like it was caught doing something. Once it realized it was being observed, it leaned back slightly and then reached forward with its claws. The creature then took one tremendous leap and cleared a seven-foot embankment and moved out of sight into a wooded area. The man estimated that leap was about 40 feet long. As it was in the process of leaping, it was perfectly straight and held its front claws forward. The legs, as it was leaping, were only slightly larger than broomsticks or about the size of a walking crane and were very long. Then just a second after the creature was gone from sight something else had occurred. A large bird, possibly an owl, suddenly rushed at the passenger side window, almost hitting the glass, then took off and did not return. It happened so fast they were unsure if it was an owl or not. The witnesses indicated that this creature appeared to be changing form. The driver said, its shape was nothing like when it was squatted. The woman stated to me that it shaped into another form. She thought it was a dark brown color and looked like a werewolf with a little back hair. She estimated that when it was leaping into the woods, she thought it stood about 9 feet tall. The woman while reluctant to say it said, I think it was a man changing into a werewolf. The man after the experience went onto the internet to try to figure out what he saw, and told me that the closest way he could describe the creature would be a gargoyle with no wings. The man commented, I will never forget what we saw that night. A friend of mine claims to have been chased by a gnarly pale looking creature while hunting in the woods with some friends of his. One of his group had a medical emergency and fell unconscious. And when my friend took off on his four-wheeler to get help. What he described as a ghostly humanoid figure gave chase. The most unsettling part was that it started gaining on him before he floored it out of there. My friend is convinced that what he saw was an angel of death that was trying to keep him from saving his buddy. Who survived after they did CPR on him. What's more, is that he had kept to incident to himself until years later. When he and his buddies were eating dinner one night and out of the blue asked one of his friends whether he had seen anything strange in the woods that night. All those years ago. The guy went pale and said he had thought we was crazy for seeing something and went on to describe the same thing that my friend saw. Obviously the whole thing is pretty far-fetched, but damn if it wasn't a good story when he told it. Three of us were deer hunting near the glen of a mall. Just as dusk was setting in we see eight people from our hide dressed in full army attire. Thought it was the defense forces at first until they started digging and retrieving items from a bunker of sorts. Turns out the area was a known burial spot for paramilitary weapons. Kept quiet for a good two hours until we could get away safely. Didn't frequent that spot for a few years. A hunter told me this story when I was younger, about 16 years ago. He was raccoon hunting in the mountains around Blair, Wyoming, around 11 p.m., a new moon night, so no natural lighting. As typical for raccoon hunters, he had three hunting dogs, 
each with a locator collar, for in an event the dogs trailed off and didn't return to the hunter. Also, the use of flashlights are limited while hunting at dark, only use white when needed, if that, green or red lenses recommended. As the dogs caught a scent, they took off through the mountain, the hunter, listening for his dogs to do what they are trained to do, tree a raccoon and bark and howl to let the hunter know they got one treat. But this night was different, he didn't hear his dogs, he instead heard this loud scream or screech, deep sound that neither resembled a human or animal. He noped out of the mountains, thinking he'll return during the light to get the dogs, being careful not to run and make too much noise, as wild animals love chasing. About an hour of hiking back to his truck, he found his dogs hiding under his truck, shivering, something that trained hunting dogs don't do, his dogs specifically, they obviously ran back to the truck, no sign of being chased back to. The hunter swears it wasn't a mountain lion or any other wild animal he knows of, as he has had run-ins with mountain lions and about every kind the Wyoming mountains has to offer. He said he has never felt so cold and scared in his life from those sounds he heard that night, has yet to hunt on that mountain since the 16 years ago. So I'm a ranger who lives and works in a remote park, in Queensland, Australia. I heard a knock on my door late at night last year. A young man from Brisbane, about a 14-hour drive away, was standing at my door. He was scared, a bit pale and a bit shaken. Transpired that he had been camping at one of my campsites, heard grunting and snarling, and they ran to the car next to his tent and drove the 30 kilometers to my house. It is a very steep, rough, clay and winding 4WD road down to my house. I don't like driving it at night at the best of time, let alone when it is drizzling with rain. After he explained the noises and grunting, I told him that he had run away and risked his life because of a male kangaroo that was trying to get it on with its girl. And I said, welcome to the bush mate. I live in a house in the woods. I was sitting on my porch one night smoking. It was late as f, but I was only going to be out for about 5 minutes so I didn't turn any lights on. So there I am in the pitch dark and silence and I hear coyotes go off in the distance, far off, probably across the road. This is fairly normal for our area. What is not normal, is that about 6 seconds after I had registered the far off noise as coyotes, another coyote went off. Probably not even 200 feet from the porch. I had never before, and have not since, Felt fear physically cascade up my spine and into the lizard part of my brain, which then proceeded to broadcast run or fight better yet piss yourself over and over again. I darted into the house so quick that I forgot to chuck my cigarette into the ashtray. Second scariest thing was when I heard barred owl on my roof. I wasn't hunting but there was this time while hiking I'll never forget. Four of my friends and I are hanging out on a beautiful summer day trying to figure out plans we're all about 17. I suggest the woods near my house, there's a trail that leads to an abandoned naval airfield. I had traveled this trail several times before this and never had anything like this happen. So my friends and I are walking along this trail and we get to the hole in the fence that leads to the airfield. As we cross through the hole I get a real eerie feeling that makes me stop. Then I notice movement in the brush in front of me, a man in a full ghillie suit holding a rifle stood up from the brush. He didn't say a word as I'm shitting my pants thinking we just interrupted a military exercise by trespassing on government property. While I start blurting out I'm sorry I didn't know. Hands up in the air my other friend silently frozen behind me. This guy starts walking towards not making a sound. He raises his rifle and points it at us and starts telling us to leave and be quiet. We back off a bit and try to figure out what was going on. The guy starts to follow us still pointing his weapon so we scramble to put distance and finally we decide to leave. As we're leaving we started to realize it was an airsoft gun and the guy was pissed we gave away his location. 
We spent the rest of the walk acting like tug guys saying had we known we could have gotten past him. I still hike a lot but probably will never hike that trail again. I own a large, popular valley in Norway. Unfortunately, it has a dark history due to two massive tsunamis in the early 1900s that killed 135 people. I go hiking there a lot and know the valley like the palm of my hand. In the summer of 2020, I was taking a long hike by the beach and up the riverside. It was a warm and slightly windy night, and I was walking up the riverbank with one air pod in my ear when I suddenly heard a loud splash in the river. I couldn't see anything, so I assumed it was a branch or rock that had fallen. As I kept moving upwards, I got this eerie sensation of being watched. I looked around and spotted this grey thing about 40 yards away on the other side of the river. It was fairly dark at this point, so I figured it wasn't anything special until it moved. I could see it more clearly now, and it was this deer looking thing, but it wasn't a deer. I blinked, and it was gone. To this day, I have not told anyone, and I don't plan to hunt or hike that area again for a while. I don't care what people think, believe or mean, this was my experience. Not me but a friend, and he wasn't the hunter, but funniest damn story. We were backpacking in WV, and had just set up camp. My buddy wanders away from camp about one kilometer to go pop a squat and answer the call. He finds a nice cozy spot and drops tro, and starts to unload a torrent of two. After a quiet moment, he hears you about finished? My buddy spins around to find a turkey hunter about 10 feet behind him, he didn't see him there when he found the spot. He quickly pulled up his pants, didn't even wipe, muttered an apology, and booked it lol. If you're not familiar, turkey hunters are the stealthiest, head-to-toe camo, deep camo with no orange, usually sitting against a tree completely motionless. Not hunting, but once when I was younger my grandpa was going to take me down into the canyon to hike around. He gave me this whole speech about how we might see snakes and how I couldn't yell and scream if we saw snakes. We were standing on the lip of the canyon rim and he turned around and took one step. I watched him step over a giant snake, sunning itself on a rock. He turned and asked why I wasn't following him and I just pointed at it and said I don't really like snakes. He ran back up over the rim of the canyon, picked me up, and ran us back into the house. I guess it was a big coral snake. Not me but some close family friends of mine on their honeymoon decided to stay in a small one-room cabin out in the woods. To the south of this cabin was the company that rents out these cabins around 4 to 5 miles away but to the north of it there is just woods and nothing else. During their second night there they heard footsteps on one side of the cabin and they were going to check outside but then saw a figure walk past the window, obviously human. The person kept circling the cabin for around an hour occasionally fiddling with the lock on the door and then walked off to the north end of the woods. The next day they asked the people who ran the company about it and they said they didn't have any other clients at the moment and most hunters stop by and say hi before going out into the woods so they have no idea who it could have been. This was in a field not a woods. Hunting one night I noticed what I believed at first to be a star. But then it moved. Not in a straight line but in every direction and at different speeds. Imagine the star was the tip of a pencil, the sky was a page and you asked a toddler to scribble. That's how it moved. It went on for about 10 minutes, stopped moving suddenly and gained altitude rapidly until it faded out of sight. Still can't explain it to this day. Gave me a chill down my back watching it. I still lived at home when I was 19 so to get some alone time with my girl we would find a nice spot in the mountains and go at it. One night when we were out there a group of 8 TV riders came by. 
This happened every so often but the riders would just keep it moving and not bother us. This night after they passed us they got about 100 yards on the road and stopped. Then to my girlfriend's horror the riders, there were five in the group, turned around and started back toward us. She was instantly terrified. I tried to calm her down telling her it was probably friends of mine. That was very possible by the way. Just in case I grabbed my pistol from under the seat. The riders stopped right in front of us blocking my car. I realized these guys were strangers and obviously drunk. I instantly had thoughts of these guys attacking me and raping my girlfriend and that was not going to happen. I jump out the back seat naked as the day I was born with pistol in hand. I told the guys to keep it moving and we just wanted to leave. This property was owned by a coal company by the way so it couldn't have been the owners asking what I was doing. The pistol didn't scare these bozos and one even asked my girlfriend to give him a peek. I was really scared at this point then so before I even knew what I was doing the fear took control and I threw up the pistol and gave them four shots over their heads. This got their attention and they all double timed it back to their ATVs and hauled ass. That was exactly what my girlfriend and I did too. In the opposite direction of course. What was really scary is that people come from all over the US to ride the trails here. So these guys might have thought they could have done something then went back to wherever they came from and no one would have ever been caught. We were both really shook up. I have no idea what those guys intentions were. Were they just scaring a couple of kids or were they going to do something darker? I couldn't take the chance though. We stuck to other more secluded spots after this. I wonder what these guys thought when I jumped out the back naked as the day I was born with my heart on. I was 19 folks it took an act of God to lose an erection, whipping in the wind with a pistol in hand. I know I have never been that scared again. Hunter and outdoorsman all of my life. The one thing that makes me want to give it all up is how we hunters act towards each other online. Grown men bashing the legal harvests of another young hunter, fellow hunters arguing over successful methods and tactics, and just the overall angst towards other hunters in general. It's sickening. Our sport seems to be dying and hunters arguing with other hunters will never benefit the future of the sport. I grew up in the woods. My parents' house was in a quiet neighborhood, in a small town in Eastern Mass. The house was set back about 100 foot from the road, we had a fenced in backyard, with a built in gate into the state forest. I grew up out there with my dad and our dog, walking, hiking, fishing, building some survivalist type log cabins, that my friends and I later turned into a paintball course. This was 20 plus years ago before there were a lot of deer or coyotes in the area, but we did occasionally come across some wildlife. Eventually my dad trusted me enough to let me go out alone. One day when I was 14 maybe, I was building a little hut and digging a trench for our paintball course, my dog ran to my side breathing super heavy, nervously and letting out short, chirping barks, something I've never heard her do before or any day after that. Looked up to see just a massive, hulking, all black fur creature about 100 foot up the hill from us. It was still for all of a second or two, then turned and moved into the woods away from us. To this day I won't go out in any woods alone. It was too big to be a black bear, I'm sure in my own mind I'm exaggerating what teenage me saw that day, but I'm absolutely positive it was at least 7 to 8 foot tall standing on all four legs and did not resemble a bear at all. I was snowmobiling years ago after a few days snowfall and unknowingly ran into and sunk down into a deep soft snow drift. I was deep down in it and was trying to dig myself out but ended up exhausted and drenched in sweat. I couldn't even move my legs or arms after hours of intense cardio and it was getting colder and colder as the sun was going down. I realized I was in deep shit but I physically couldn't move anymore. Couldn't believe I was about to spend a frigid night in minus 20 degree weather. I thought I was going to die. 
Then out of nowhere a couple of rednecks came pulling up in their own snowmobiles and dug me out and saved my ass. It was really scary by the end. The relief I felt when they pulled up and looked at me and said you got yourself into a bit of a pickle huh? Filled me with so much relief. I couldn't even be embarrassed I was so thankful to them. Never snowmobiled since, never will. I was solo hiking on a popular trail in Humboldt or Redwoods National Park. I was staying away from other people on purpose and couldn't see or hear anyone else who may have been on the same trail. Also, the trail and parking lot wasn't crowded that day and it felt like I was alone in the forest. I can't remember if I felt being watched first or heard a rustle. I saw a quick glimpse of a man. He continued to stalk or match my pace or location on the trail but he was unseen and a few feet off in the forest. I speed walked to the next couple on the trail and stayed about 10 feet behind them until we were back in the parking lot. Once I caught up to the couple, he stepped out and showed himself with sort of a smile and then went back in the forest. He was a man in his 20s 30s, he seemed well groomed, dressed in neutral hiking clothes with a backpack. The experience gave me chills. I am also aware of people disappearing in that area, but not sure if it is by choice or not or if he was practicing some weird skills. Not terrifying for me, but my partner watched me step on a snake during a desert hike and the snake quickly struck my shoe. If he didn't ask me if I was okay and tell me about it, then I would have never known it happened. Sure enough, there were two puncture holes in my gym shoes, I wasn't even wearing hiking boots. Northern Ontario, Canada, it was a nice sunny July afternoon. Girlfriend and I pull into a friend's cabin way off grid. No one's there yet, so we started to unpack the pickup truck. Suddenly, we hear horrifying screaming, which turns into what I can only describe as gorilla ooh ooh ah ah kind of in and out sound. It lasted so long, and I could feel the bass in my chest. I didn't see anything yet, but whatever made that noise was close. When I was a kid, probably seven or eight, I was out dirt biking in the woods with my dad. These were trails through a nature preserve that were approved for dirt biking and such but the forests are protected. Well, we come across these two sketchy looking characters logging in the woods super illegally. They are in the trail and we stop and they start talking to us, telling us about how it's their uncle's land and they just got out of jail and were logging it. We knew it was illegal but didn't really want to bring up what the obviously new hole out in the middle of the woods. After a few minutes, one of the guys stops, looks at us and goes man, it's kinda like deliverance out here isn't it? My dad gave me the look and we immediately ripped out of there. Watching horror films as a kid pays off. Bear hunting in Sweden. We hunt with a barking dog that usually makes the bear stay still so that the shot is easier. A good bear hunt is usually a quite mundane activity with a bear walking past a hidden hunter and dying within seconds of the shot. This time however I saw the dog moving in a strange star-shaped pattern. It was basically retreating from a point, 100 meters or so, and then back again. I heard it barking and when the dog named Ulf, an old jammed hunt with a long life of hunting experience, was running at 30 kilometers an hour something was obviously off. I start walking towards him to try to call him in and stop whatever madness was going on, when I experienced it. I see the thin but very tall birch trees in front of me moving like a scene from Jurassic Park. And I hear the sound of paws like drumming on the ground when it was running together with its breathing like Vog. Vog, Vog, Vog. I took a stand behind a fallen tree and thought what the F am I doing with my life? Then comes Ulf, the dog, running for his life with a crazy here we go. Look. And behind Ulf comes the bear in full speed. Was it big etc? Yeah enough to take me at least. The bear stops when it sees me and we get eye contact at about 10 meters between us with me directing my hunt towards its head 
I wanted it to die on the spot in case I would shoot. Then when both Alf and the bear are standing still I hear a twig breaking somewhere else behind the bear. Two cubs come out of the shrubbery behind it. They are so cute and just look like they are having the blast of their lives. I kept aiming at the mama bear thinking don't make me do this. Until it left with its cubs. We cancelled the bear hunt in that area and it was the last time I hunted bear. I could have easily shot the mama bear by accident before seeing the cubs, thinking it was alone. I decided that I don't want to hunt with that possibility, so that was enough bear hunting for me. I still meet them from time to time, but under better circumstances. One time I was solo camping on Crown Land in Ontario. This is out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody around for miles type nowhere. So night time rolls around and I'm in my tent just laying there enjoying the quiet. All of a sudden I heard loud footsteps coming around my sight, near where I had my fire pit dug. I figured it was a bear or moose because they're definitely around the area. Suddenly I get a whiff of cigarette smoke unmistakable smell of cigarette smoke in the nice clean woods nighttime air. I hop out of the tent with my shotgun in hand and there's some guy snooping around my belongings. He doesn't seem surprised or scared. He says oh and just walks away. I don't know who he was, what he wanted, or where he came from. Like this area is middle of Alaska type wilderness. I didn't sleep that night and I packed up out headed out break of dawn. In March 2021, I woke up in the middle of the night and went downstairs to check on my pet Irish setter. It was dark in the living room when I got there. Every light in the house was off except for the electric night lights all around the perimeter of the downstairs and upstairs. So, you can easily see things while walking around in the dark. My house is kind of small and next to a few large local trailer parks. To my surprise, when I got downstairs my dog was awake in its crate and looking up at a huge 9 foot tall hunched over dog man. The terrifying thing was towering up to the ceiling and was so tall that it was hunched over just to fit in the living room by our pet's crate. I am 6 foot 2 inches tall and skinny but even I had to tilt my neck upward just to look up at it. My dog was awake staring straight up at it. I never keep my dog in the crate but sometimes my family snatches him from me and puts him in there. Anyway, this nasty looking cryptid had strange feet and stood only on its tiptoes. It was not flat footed like people are. It was impossible for a person to stand this way which made me shudder. The thing had very little fur on its body, but really only had a giant mane of hair from its head, neck, and upper back downward. The hair was super long too but the rest of its body lacked hair this is why I mentioned mole rats in my previous post even though these creatures are obviously not related. Its arms were outstretched to its sides extremely far as well because it obviously had no idea what it was like to be in my house before. It must have had to feel the walls of the small house with its arms just to move around. The arms were too long and far stretched out to even be a person in an outfit. It was obviously downstairs for a while making noise trying to eat my pet. This explains why I woke up out of nowhere like that. What was scariest was that the dog man was standing there practically frozen in time looking at me with ears pointing straight up. It was processing my location and was slowly moving toward me. At first, when I saw it, it was stunned and did not want to move, but when I got closer to it, it started slowly moving toward me and I panicked hardcore as anyone would. Its face was the nastiest, most gnarly thing ever. Huge elongated snout when it turned its head suddenly. It looked like something with nasty rabies or mange and that tells me it was underground for a while struggling or starving. Its teeth were grossly sharp. I ran as fast as possible bumping into walls over and over with it breathing loudly while I was yelling at the top of my lungs in terror. I was falling in my socks too while trying to climb the stairs to wake up my relatives. My dog was just listening to everything at that point and he hardly made noise because he was obviously shaken too. When I got to my mom she woke up screaming too and called the police while hiding in her room. 
I booked it back downstairs with some blades to find the living room empty. Then I realized it could have been in any room in my small home, such as the kitchen, bathroom, or basement, so I booked it out the front door in the night, knowing that my mom was safe with her husband barricaded in her room with them both yelling. I informed them in time that something was downstairs. I figured with quick thinking that all of us yelling probably could scare the thing away, as you would do when encountering a bear or wolf in the woods. I booked it out of the front door and walked about 10 miles in the night with bare necessities I could grab in time. I was terrified and only had blades, I am a 26 year old felon and I am not allowed to own or carry firearms. I walked away like this because I did not want to find the thing unexpectedly in my house in some random room that I did not check, such as the basement or bathroom. I was just happy to be gone and alive while the cops checked everywhere for the giant intruder. I've been in cuffs a bunch of times too and do not trust cops anyway unless they are just with my mom and her husband. I got lucky. After all, I was more familiar with my house than the dogman was. Anyway, the best part for last. When I got back home, a large glass window which was approximately 5 feet tall and 4 feet wide was completely shattered the thing obviously had a direct line of sight from our large backyard into my kitchen and living room, directly where the dog slept, and my family thought it was me that broke the window. Turns out that the dog man tore through our house from this one glass window. I had to yell at my family for about a year until my mom and brother admitted they were wrong and that the thing obviously existed. Finally, my dog does not run into the night anymore when I open the door of the house. One of the accounts that I recently heard, while listening to YouTube, nearly caused me to crash my car. It was a story about the sighting of a large humanoid creature wearing what appeared to be a black cloak, with an owl's face, in the central Florida area. Talk about a heart-stopping moment. Here is my encounter with a similar entity. It was an afternoon in late May this year, 2021. I remember it was later in the afternoon, early evening, but it was a slightly overcast and gray day, so I can't tell you from memory if it was dusk or earlier. I live near a nature conservation area in the central Florida area. My husband and I were very fortunate to find our property, ample acreage, heavily wooded to the point where we could not see our neighbors or any lights from their homes. We lovingly call our home the swamp. I was outside in our driveway, which is the only cleared space on our land, save for a natural circular clearing in our woods. I was walking back to our porch when for some reason, I was compelled to turn and look back to the tree line, around 80 to 100 feet away from the house. I do want to note that there was not a single ounce of fear in me, in fact, I was quite calm when I made eye contact with it. At first, I didn't register what I was looking at. I knew it was an owl, which for my woods is not an uncommon sighting. But then it kind of shifted and I saw more of it. It was not just an owl. It was the head of an owl on what I can only describe as the shoulders of a human, and it looked like it was wearing a dark cloak, either made of dark foliage or feathers. It was tall, and from the trees around it, I guessed around 7 feet or so. It just looked at me, and I looked at it. I looked around and blinked, sincerely thinking it was a trick of the lighting, or my mind creating a thing where there was nothing, but no, when I looked back it was still there, calm and unmoving. I was still unafraid, which is not normal for me as I can freak myself out easily. For some reason, I felt another urge, this time to nod. I nodded towards it like I was showing my acknowledgement of it, it felt natural and right to do so, then turned and went inside my home. I did not go back outside that day, but the next morning I went back outside and stood in the same place on my porch to look at what it may have been and there was nothing I could even remotely try to place as it. The space where it stood was between two trees at the opening to the forest line leading back to the small clearing, there were no low hanging branches, no large leaves, no anything that I could trick myself into believing that was what I had actually seen. I have not seen it since then. I did some mild searching on the internet but found nothing even remotely close to it so I just let it go. Until today, when I heard that story about an hour ago now. 
Does anyone know what this might be? Has anyone else in the central FL area, or anywhere, seen anything like this? My boyfriend experienced something very unusual and I'm reaching out to see if you have heard about anyone else who has ever experienced anything similar. This occurred in northwestern North Carolina in 2022. He and his partner at the time were sleeping in bed. They were in a bedroom that had French doors that opened to the backyard. The house is on a large piece of property with a stream that comes straight out of the mountain from an aquifer. He awoke randomly and saw two red eyes pass by the window of the French doors about seven to eight feet off of the ground. The door opened, as a very intense vibration started and he sat up to scream and could not hear himself yelling. He could see his cat at the edge of the bed hissing. His partner didn't stir. The vibration caused him to fall back and he passed out. He woke up face down on the bed with his head turned towards the edge of the mattress. He was unable to move. A figure rose and was completely out of focus a few inches from his face. He states its motion was so unnaturally fluid. He could see his surroundings but could not focus on the creature. He explains it as if the creature was out of focus in a photograph. He then unfocused his eyes, used his peripheral vision, and was able to see the creature clearly. He states it had brown-green coloring with scales and a worn face bright red eyes that glowed. When he saw the creature and was able to really decipher what he was looking at. It opened a very large mouth and gave him a gigantic toothy smile. He says he felt its energy, that it was amused at him for figuring out how to see it. The vibration began again as he watched the creature sink back out of view below the edge of the mattress before passing out again. He awoke several hours later and his partner had no idea anything had occurred. He said the entire time he felt no emotion. No fear, no anger, nothing. He says he knows something violent happened to him and he thinks they wanted to take him but didn't. He had rows of red dots across his back and stated it looked like he laid on a bed of nails. He assumes this type of humanoid creature came from underground and travels or lives through the cave systems here. We know there's got to be some sort of opening in the land where the aquifer exits and the water flows down the property. This is his father's property, about 10 acres. We now live across the street and I lock my doors out of paranoia now. The correlation between missing persons around cave systems is unsettling and I wonder if this has anything to do with it. Are any similar experiences? In Boonville, Indiana, on February 20, 2024, a woman was found in a drainage culvert along Highway 62, with multiple severe injuries. She was found 350 yards away from the Sheriff's Department complex and county garage. From what we have gathered in our neighborhood, I live a half mile from all of these locations. Apparently she was attacked by a large unknown and unidentified canine. The local news media hasn't received any further updates since around 10 a.m. This is a very small and tight-knit community. Why haven't the local news stations been updated within 9 to 10 hours? My son Jake first showed his awareness of the natural world when he was only two he pointed at a something I couldn't see in a tree and said cheap cheap before three birds took flight. Our adopted dog Toby had runaway fever, but Jake was always able to find him in an afternoon of driving around. The fatherly sense within told me that Jake was tapping into something greater than intuition, and I wanted to test it. Jake's first hunting lesson was killing the barn rats out back. Jake didn't take to his 22 and despised the act of killing, even for fair vermin like the 5 pound rats that ate our stores. But he did it, and he was good at it. Really good. I couldn't understand it. Jake was tagging leaping, zigzagging rats with single shots while I was lucky just to graze one if I were able to do that at his age of 10, I would have thought I were one of the world's most deadly men, but apparently my son had more constraint and tact than I did. He bagged 32 rats in two and a half hours. I had four. Jake confirmed that only three male rats remained, and that they would scatter to find mates. Jake was right. 
Jake acted as my guide when we hunted and fished together. My son led me right to the biggest buck or fish without hesitation or delay, every time. I didn't consider having Jake as a hunting guide as cheating I considered it how God intended for us to have our little edge out here on this hard world at winning father, son hunting competitions. The hunting purses went to entry fees to bigger events, and more time with my son. Truth be told, his mother hated the weeks of away in the wilderness until I set down our biggest purse to date for dragging in a 603 pound black marlin. I had to set the entire cash prize down in front of her, just so that she could see what $1.3 million really looks like before it went to the bank a towering 7-foot monolith made of $100 bills on a wood pallet. Jake had located the black-striped marlin won it for us on his 16th birthday. After the winnings, my wife now saw Jake's talent for what it was a gift honed by years of field training, a gift that reached beyond the sporting world like the girl. We were all driving back from the grocery store when Jake made us stop the car he knew there's someone not far from the highway who needed our help. We stopped and followed Jake to what looked like an old dry well, where we found a girl had fallen through the rotted board sealing the opening. Jake got his photo taken with the first responders, it made the cover of two local newspapers under the headline Boy Finds, Saves Local Girl from Derelict Water Tank but my wife still disliked all the time away from home, that couldn't be changed. But our address could. So we took the rest of the big prize and purchased a house out of state, somewhere wooded, closer to nation's largest competitions. 127 McKean Street's 144 photos and videos all showed a very nice, modern two-story home for a 50 grand under similar places, divorce distress sale. The chief of police of the town owned it and vouched for its condition personally. Based on photos alone, and we packed up our things and drove for two solid days, 1,600 miles home. 144 pictures and 19 phone conversations aside, to buy a property sight unseen seemed dumber to my wife and I the longer we drove. Our anxiety stayed with us until we saw the home's welcoming neighborhood, immaculate exterior and fresh open partially furnished rooms inside. My wife loved the gardens and the views, I loved the garage and the fact that all the foundation and guts of the house were new. My son reserved immediate judgment. He was even a little hesitant walking into the house. As we unpacked, my son kept nervously looking around, as if he were waiting for something to come out and bite him. His paranoia came to a peak when he hung off the second-story guardrail to rip out a light bulb at the center of the wall below. Jake took the bulb outside and smashed it in the street. I went to go have a talk with him I told him I trusted him, even with my life and I never once questioned him, but now I needed to know why he smashed that bulb. Jake looked back at the house for a very long time and said, Dad. I don't track those animals by the little hints in the ground or by what the waters are doing. It's a sense, from an organ that's probably in my brain, like your nose. But only I have this kind of nose, the kind that sniffs out where animals even people are. And I can't describe smell to someone who never had a nose. But I can smell in a different way, even in the dark, even if you cast my head in plaster. And that light bulb was alive, dad. I sensed it like a living bird, a dog you or me, like that girl down in the water tank. That bulb was at least piece of something living. Like an eye. I asked my son if the light bulb still was living. He looked down at the bulb shards in the street and muttered no. Not like before. But. He didn't finish the sentence as he stared up at our new, pastel-colored cooker-cutter townhouse. He seemed to be consumed with grim concern. At the time, my wife and I were exhausted from driving 800 miles while being on our last few hundred dollars, and the idea of blowing that at a dirty motel for an indefinite period of time was not an option I was willing to take. I will admit that I dismissed my son's concerns into puberty-induced paranoia. I also dismissed the realization of how silly that reasoning was. This house was nice. It was cheap, next to some big prize tournaments plain and simple. I'll live with sentient light bulbs. What are they going to do? Turn off and on? Turn my house into a rave?
We appreciated the fact the house came with nice dressers, bureaus and beds with factory plastic still on them. A fantastic sight for burnout travelers with a leaking air mattress. We had just enough energy to unpack the sheets to make the bed, crashing immediately. I don't remember how long I slept, but I woke in the dark not being able to move, like the bed was holding me like it was the world's most powerful magnet and I was made of pure iron. I saw wife struggle meekly under the blankets she made little sounds as if she were in pain the worst part was, I couldn't even lift an arm to knock off the blanket to see what was wrong. I would have been dead if it weren't for Jake pulling ripping me off of the bed. I fell limp in my son's arms I didn't lack the energy, I wasn't winded, I simply didn't have the bodily strength to stand. Worse yet, when I fell, my bare feet and hands that touched the hardwood floor, and I could feel that magnetic suction again. My son, 165 pounds, carried me, formerly 230 pounds, down the stairs and out of the house as if I were his petite bride and set me on the front lawn. My bed was alive too, Dad, Jake said as he helped me stand on wobbly legs. I never got in it. I went to your guy's room to wake you up but you were already in. I collapsed again. I told Jake to dial 911. I was surprised to see the police chief that owned the home before us show up with the fire department. They went up to the bedroom and found my wife's underwear in our bed but no woman. The chief had a steadfast belief that my wife was simply confused and lost and that she'll turn up any time now, and laughed when I told what happened, with being stuck to the bed. He even laughed when I told him that I was 230 pounds and 6 foot 5 a few hours ago now, I was about the same height and weighed less as my son. He asked what, do you want me to believe this house was somehow eating you? That it ate your wife? Are you insane? That's exactly what I wanted him to believe, and if I were not as big as I were, it would have totally absorbed me like it did to my wife. Until they found her. The chief came back with my wife wrapped in one of those heavy white trauma blankets. Both of them were beaming unflinching smiles. My wife said silly me, I got turned around in a closet and didn't know where I was. Much better now. And the chief nodded with satisfaction. I never heard my wife talk like that, and the woman I know would never be turned around in a closet. Jake then pulled me away from the crowd and whispered I don't know what the chief or that lady claiming to be mom are, but they are not alive. I went on a 20 miler on August 28, 2022 on a trail near Batstow village. We misjudged how long we'd be out there for and it started to get dark and we began to run out of water. Our headlamps also began to die. But the worst part was when we began to hear whispering voices and figures out of the corners of our eyes, we got separated from the other people we were hiking with and when we regrouped they said they experienced the same thing. We would also see the same marked tree over and over again like we were going in a circle. We didn't get out of the trail until 10 p.m. in the pitch dark. Friend and I took six kids hiking on AP a day, hers, mine, two she was babysitting, and a friend of my oldest. We get to this little bridge just to the side of the path used for days when that spot gets super mucky, and the kids were running back and forth across it pretending to be billy goats yelling wake up troll. Not long after, some bent little old man with a bulbous nose and his toque on badly so it looked pointy comes down the trail. Friend and I quietly joke so the kids can't hear that maybe they did wake a troll. As we're trying to pass him he grabs my four-year-old and demands kisses from her and will not let go. Friend rips my kid out of his reach, passes her to me, and I shove six screaming kids down the path as fast and far as we could book it. Report him to the cops they meet us in the woods. Later find me and tell me they found the guy, he was just an old man from the old country and doesn't understand social boundaries, they let him off with a warning. My oldest says he's still in the woods when Thier class goes for walks sometimes. They stay as far from him as they can manage. It's been 11 years, we haven't seen him in a while. But this dude singled put the smallest, most vulnerable child in the group and tried to force kisses on it.
I don't hike without the ability to defend myself anymore. I was near Lake Huron in Ontario and I was driving south in a taxi. I was working as a taxi driver at the time and I passed an area and on the way back, only about 10 minutes later, I came upon the most bizarre scene. There was a deer cut in half in the road and it was not hit by a truck. This deer looked like it had been through quite a struggle and there were large footprints all around it. Standing over top of it was about an eight and a half foot Bigfoot. It looked like yellow flashlights were glowing out of his eyes. I took my car and I passed the Bigfoot. I put it in reverse. I hit the gas. I drove through the Bigfoot. His arm went through the windows of my car and through my head and it was like he was a hologram and he moved very quickly when he did this. After that, it went over to the side of the road and it looked like it was climbing down into the ditch and down into the ground like there was a hole there. It was the most bizarre thing that ever happened. To see a deer cut in half like that with something that a car couldn't do. I was like, well if this isn't a physical creature, how did he rip this deer in half? There were bloody footprints all around the deer. I tried to hit it because I thought if I could at least do some damage to the Bigfoot we would have won finally. A quick background, I've been a fan of high strangeness, the paranormal, and unexplained phenomena since I was about 12 and found an old Reader's Digest style our mysterious world book amongst my dad's stuff. I'm now in my late 30s and I've experienced enough weird and uncanny events that I'm a firm believer, including intuition that saved my life more than once. But I have to stress I'm a pretty sensible person for the most part and nobody of particular note. I have a family, kids, and a happy married life. I know elements of what I'm about to relay are going to be fairly insane. So take everything with a grain of salt and an open mind. I'll be interested to know if you've ever heard anything like this before and the only reason I am even willing to share this is because you seem to be the guy for this sort of thing. In early 2012 I was going through a very difficult time in my life and for amusement, my wife and I visited a local psychic in Grand Prairie, Alberta. My wife's reading was filled with errors and information we knew to be wrong, but we played along for a laugh. When it came to my turn, this obvious charlatan precisely described my deceased German grandfather with details of his appearance that nobody could know and personal details about the last time I saw him alive that left me speechless. She also advised us that the spirits wanted us to know the deep freeze we had been given for free from our surly next door neighbor we didn't really know had once held a dead body and we needed to get rid of it because it had dark energy attached to it. This freaked us out because this stupid freezer had a makeshift gas block on it and we didn't think anything of it. To shorten this part of the story, I began texting the psychic directly, and out of nowhere, she told me I should look into reptilian aliens. Now, I should note that while I loved weird and unexplained stories, I was absolutely freaked out when I was younger by stories of evil reptilians and blood-drinking shapeshifting lizard people from many late-night internet dives, and I specifically stayed away from those tales out of genuine discomfort and fear. I could handle ghosts, alien abductions, cattle mutilations, the occult, etc., but I was terrified that reptilians might actually exist out there in some dark corner of reality. In retrospect, that fact is deeply amusing, but it was a weird thing for this maybe psychic to zero in on. And I started reading about lizard people online, running into the Lacerta files, the whole shape-shifting madness, etc. I didn't see the point of following that trail, because I was straight up having nightmares about it and felt like a little kid, and we stopped talking to the psychic lady shortly after that because the whole experience genuinely weirded us out. So you can imagine the terror I experienced one afternoon when I was working in the basement pit of a drive through oil change outfit and saw a huge muscular mustard yellow scaly lizard man with a stubby face, a heavy brow, and horrible piercing yellow eyes. I'll never forget literally walking through the brick wall at the far end of the basement, staring at me with a clear air of disdain, and then vanishing in a blink. I have to stress I'm talking about a full flesh and blood figure that occupied physical space and cast a shadow on the ground. 
I could tell he was male, he had pants and a vest on, and he carried an unpleasant odor. Then blink, gone. All of it. The experience shook me so bad that I swore off paranormal stuff and I never told another living soul about what I had seen, fearing I was losing my mind. That's just the start of the story. I haven't gotten to the weird part yet. Flash forward a year. We moved to central Alberta, my life improved, and I had largely forgotten the reptilian thing, having chalked it up to the stress I was under, my mind playing tricks on me, etc. I think I suppressed it mentally because it caused me real distress and trauma. Then randomly I began hearing a voice in my head when I was alone. It was separate from my own internal monologue and thoughts. It felt like a presence in my head and it gave me headaches at first. I really thought I was insane now, especially when this voice started to form intelligible words in a female voice, offering commentary, warnings, and simple yes and no answers. It was the freakiest thing at first, and I genuinely considered mental health, but I kept it to myself. I mean, do you admit you're hearing a voice in your head? I hoped it would go away. But it didn't. And the sense of presence grew stronger over time. It also got easier for this other to talk to me, as if it was becoming easier to get through. And then, at once, a floodgate opened, and this voice could now talk to me. The headache stopped. It just. Kind of became a thing I lived with. Then things escalated to regular conversation contained in my head, and this other identified herself as a humanoid reptilian female originally from the Capella star system although she was quite clear that she wasn't a physical entity in our earthly sense and existed beyond perception in another level of reality. So, at this point, I'm sure I'm insane. This is two months of this and I have this voice in my head talking to me. There were truly freaky qualities to it. She has an accent, she explained she's not actually speaking English but my brain is decoding her speech and relaying it in a form of mental telepathy that is actually pretty common where she is. I could tune her out if I wanted to, but when she was nearby she offered helpful advice, mild precognition, and cautions of what I should and shouldn't do, such as having me avoid a particular stretch of road only to find out there was an accident later on, only wanted positive thoughts things for me and began to explain she was in fact my assigned spirit guide, or guardian angel, or whatever you want to call it. There's so much to explain with that, but this is already getting too long. One night, overwhelmed by the whole thing, I finally broke down to my wife and explained I had a voice in my head, and to my utter incredulity, my wife didn't offer to lock me up after asking many questions but said she had the same kind of guide L did but she couldn't talk to hers like I could and gets feelings instead and she, in turn, didn't want me to think she was nuts. So, yeah. This hasn't changed. In fact, I've formed a close and beneficial relationship with this being over the last decade. She's told me things I couldn't possibly have known on my own, slyly told me about future events years before they happened, and she's been nothing but a positive influence on my life. And specifically, she's here for my benefit. So much has happened that would take another thousand words to tell, but I am utterly convinced I am in regular contact with my own personal interdimensional lizard woman from across space and time. It's very very important that I stress that this is a day-to-day interaction. Sometimes I receive her loud and clear, sometimes she is kind of a delay, but I don't do any special meditation or ritual to reach her. She's just there if I need her. Likewise, she pops in when she wants. Now, there's an element to this story that takes it beyond madness. About three years ago my young daughter started seeing the rainbow lizard as in she started seeing my frigging lizard woman in both dreams and as an ethereal being. She described her physical appearance perfectly, her coloring, and passed on things that she was told to tell me that, uh, pretty much confirmed this is a real thing and it's not just me. The rainbow reference comes from the fact my daughter always sees her with shimmering fluctuating colors like LSD or DMT style tripping. I'm told this is a side effect of us not having the same perception of color that lizard has on her side. To this day she'll still claim to have seen a rainbow lizard at night. 
My wife has also intimately experienced the phenomena, electronics being messed with, messages from her guide that were repeatedly independent of mine, and so on. It's all very matter of fact for us. And in closing, I'm also completely straight laced and have never done any drugs in my life and I've never been drunk. Just thought I should say that. For the last few days I've been home alone. Completely alone in an empty apartment. A few weeks ago, my boyfriend got a great job offer out of state. We've been wanting to move out of Florida for a quite a long time so when he got the offer, we didn't hesitate to pack up and head out of town. Even with a full month of rent paid at our current apartment. With the quick move, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye to several good friends and figured since the rent was paid, I'd come back myself and spend a couple of weeks. My job allows me to work remote or from their Florida office so even though my apartment is empty, no cable or internet, I still had a place to work. When I said the apartment was empty, it wasn't completely true. I had a large piece of furniture I decided to sell rather than move and posted it on Craigslist. This is where I think I made a big mistake. I posted my address. Granted, my address wasn't up long, the furniture sold that same day. But since I posted the ad yesterday, weird things have been happening. The first thing that happened didn't seem that strange at first. Thing is I have a cat so I'm used to noises coming from all over and almost every time it's the cat being, well, a cat. He's the type that likes to knock things on the ground for fun. Oh, you were drinking that? Yep, no remorse. So when I was laying on my air mattress reading God and heard a bunch of commotion from the kitchen I just thought, oh there he goes again and went back to reading. Until I remembered the cat isn't even here. We took him to our new place. So I awkwardly rolled off the air mattress, why is it so difficult to get up off these things? And went to the kitchen to investigate. A few red solo cups that had previously been on the kitchen counter were on the ground. I looked around and the only thing I could figure is that the fan was on and it had blown them off. At least that's what I told myself in order to get to sleep. The truth is those cups had been sitting on the counter the whole day. And the fan was on. Why did they just fall to the ground now? I put it out of my head and turned the lights out and read my Kindle a bit more before falling asleep. I woke up at 3 am to a rattling or jingling sound. Like someone was shaking a jar of pennies or maybe a set of janitor's keys. I'd never heard a sound like this before, nothing even slightly close. It seemed like it was coming more from outside the apartment but it was still really loud. As soon as I got out of bed, the noise stopped. I turned on every light in the house but couldn't find the source. So I went back to bed with all the lights on. It was comforting having all the lights on and I slipped into a deep sleep almost immediately. When I woke up this morning, I didn't realize until I flipped on the light switch in the bathroom that every light in the house was off. No one has ever told me I sleepwalk but I couldn't think of any other reason the lights were turned off. The front door is locked by a deadbolt and a regular door lock. I shook it off and got ready for work. When I had showered and gotten dressed, I grabbed my purse to leave but I couldn't find my keys. Because I hate searching for my keys in the mess I call a purse, I keep them on a carabiner and clip them to my bag. It's such a habit, I clip them to my bag without even thinking about it. When I didn't find them on my purse I figured there's always a chance, I don't know, that I put them in the freezer with the groceries I brought home or put them on the kitchen counter by mistake. But I looked everywhere and nothing. They weren't in the freezer, fridge, microwave, counters, bathroom or anywhere else. Then I remembered the jingling sound I heard in the middle of the night. I went to look, even though it was nearly impossible for them to be outside, the only way is if they had fallen out of my bag on my way in the house. And I needed them to get into the house so would have missed them last night, not now. I went outside and there were my keys, lying on welcome mat outside my front door covered in something red. Like blood, or something that looks awfully similar. That's when I knew I might have made a big mistake posting my address on Craigslist. I'll see what happens tonight and post an update if anyone's interested. Story time. 
I'm sending you a Navy SEAL story as told by my late grandfather. So his Navy SEAL team was led by Felix Giant and had been tasked with investigating the strange occurrences that had arisen in the wake of the disaster in a small town near Hiroshima, Japan. As they navigated through the rubble-strewn streets, they encountered survivors, their faces etched with fear and disbelief as they recounted stories of creatures from Japanese folklore roaming the streets. They pressed on, determined to uncover the truth behind these unsettling reports. It was during that search that they stumbled upon a dilapidated laboratory hidden amidst the ruins. Inside, the air was thick with the scent of decay and something far more sinister. As they cautiously made their way through the dimly lit corridors, their senses heightened to the eerie silence that enveloped them, a sudden movement caught their attention. There, standing before them, was a yakai unlike any they had ever seen. Its form was a twisted amalgamation of human and beast, its skin as pale as death itself and eyes that glowed with an ghostly light. Its presence seemed to defy the laws of nature, sending shivers down their spine as they struggled to comprehend its existence. Without hesitation, they opened fire, the sound of gunfire echoing through the desolate halls. But to their astonishment, the yokai simply vanished into thin air, leaving behind only a lingering sense of dread. They scoured the laboratory, searching for any trace of the creature, but found nothing. It was as if it had never been there at all. Exhausted and bewildered, they made their way back to the surface, their minds reeling with the horrors they had witnessed. Upon their return, they relayed their encounter to the Japanese forces, hoping for answers or guidance. But to their dismay, they simply nodded in understanding, their expressions grim. No one will ever believe what you have seen, they said solemnly. And as my grandfather looked into their eyes, he knew that they were right. The truth of that fateful day would remain buried beneath the rubble, known only to those who had experienced it firsthand. So, I know in the past I mentioned an encounter with what I think may have been a dogman, yet I haven't posted the full story. It's taken me a while to find the time, and it's taken a long time for the trauma to settle, so that this period in my life could be looked at from a more objective viewpoint. I've never really revealed anything this personal to the general public before, and I anticipate this post may get a bit more attention as well, so it's a bit nerve-wracking for me. But after keeping it secret for years, I think it's about time this becomes known. Before anyone gets too invested in this post, I should note that I did not actually see that much of the dogman. I put that in quotes because I am still not 100% sure if that is what it was, but I still find it the most plausible. This is more about the experience and how it and the creature have affected my life. So, here it is. This experience took place when I was 10 years old. At the time, I only had my mother taking care of me, no father around. We lived with my great-grandmother and pa for the majority of my childhood. My mom had made friends with a woman who owned a large lakefront property near Lake Michigan in Wisconsin. She made an offer to let us live in a small cabin on the property she owned in exchange for work at her art shop. So we ended up flying up in approximately 2007. One thing that helps me remember the year is that the next year after we came back, Obama was elected president. Now, this property was located in a relatively isolated area. There were other inhabitants in the general area, but from the main road, you would have to turn onto this gravel road that led into this heavily wooded area, drive for a minute or two, and then you would be on the property. On this property was a small, deep pond, a shed, the woman's house which was decent, not too upscale but better than our cabin, and behind the house was a cliff that overlooked a shoreline of Lake Michigan. Once you get onto the property, you are surrounded by woods. In hindsight, it sounds like I'm describing a horror movie setting. So when we first arrived there, I believe it was mid or late summer, possibly early fall. One weird detail was the presence of this large, red, dead fish that was just laying on the ground. I found it in between the small, deep pond and the shed. It was so out of place. 
It was a big fish and couldn't have come from that little pond. I have tried to Google what types of large red fish live in Lake Michigan, but nothing I found looks like the fish I saw. The closest thing I could compare it to was a red snapper. Now that I look it up, it looks a lot like it. Part of my mind is trying to rationalize this as maybe someone from the woman's household bought it, didn't like it, and threw it out. But why anyway? That was just the first of many odd things that occurred. I honestly can't remember too many other normal life details of my time spent in Wisconsin since we were barely there a year. But when winter came, that's when I remember things started to get a little strange. In the snow around the shed, there were these odd, huge footprints. The thing is, I remember them being round and sort of compared their roundness to an elephant's foot, but I don't think they were that round. Just rounder than any normal snow footprint I've seen. My mother chalked them up to bare footprints since that was the only rational explanation we could come up with. But I don't remember them being shaped like a bear's. There were also some other strange snow prints. One of them looked like someone put on a pair of snow skis and walked through the snow a little. The strange thing about them is, after a while, they just stopped. My mother was weirded out about these ones. It was like whatever was walking there flew away or disappeared or something. I've considered that someone around there may have been walking in snow skis, but this was a fairly level, dense forest. My mom said she heard something on the radio about a wallaby escaping from captivity or something, so we just kind of sort of assumed it may have been that. We made a cute little song about bears and wallabies playing on the range or something. Now for the shitty part. Fast forward a couple of months. It was in the middle of winter, and it was absolutely freezing cold outside. We're talking sub-zero temperatures. I think because we were so close to the lake, it was worse. This encounter happened late at night. Our cottage had one floor and a loft where I slept. I can't remember every detail of what exactly happened, but everything seemed normal until I was woken up by my mother panicking in the middle of the night. She ordered me to stay up in the loft and not come down. I was so confused and scared because I had never seen her act like this and she wouldn't tell me what was going on. She had me bring up the ladder so in case something got in it would have a harder time reaching me. So for about what felt like an hour I stayed in the loft, watching my mom as she was looking at the window with a knife in one hand and a phone on the other scared shitless until the police arrived. When they got there, she told them she heard banging on the side of our cottage, which didn't make sense to me at the time because I didn't hear anything like that. We left the place that night and found a motel which was just about to close until we came. I remember what that room looked like. That was without a doubt the most traumatic night of my life. I thought we were going to die because something was after us, and I'm pretty sure my mom did too. We had just moved to this cottage in Wisconsin, and we weren't even there for a full year. The incident was so terrifying that my mom immediately booked a flight back to Pia where we originally lived, but our flight was delayed. I remember doing what kids do, be impatient and move around a lot in the airport. I had stepped on a metal part of this flat escalator, which left dirt marks. This janitor guy got mad at me, and so did my mother, and I went back to feeling like shit. While we were sitting in the waiting area, there was this rude family with a girl who was making fun of me for some reason, pointing and laughing at me a little bit. We were unfortunately seated next to each other on the flight, and for some reason she started picking off her hair and placing them on my mom. It was an awkward flight with a lot of tension which made it even worse. I also remember cussing at them on the way out of the airport. It was out of character for me to do, but got him was I out of it. Since we were and still are very poor, we have lived with my great-grandmother for most of my childhood, never truly owning a home or property. So when we left Wisconsin, we had to come back. Things seemed to be normal for a while, and it had been a couple of months after this incident. Then, for some unknown reason, my mother began behaving extremely neurotic, which I had no clue why. It really stressed me out when she would do this. I can't exactly remember what she was doing, 
but it was enough to stress a young child out. One day she slept for longer than usual, and when she woke up she thought she had urinated blood as her urine was a darkish color. She kept saying that she had missing time, like she had experienced an unusual amount of missing time or something. This insanity went on for about a week or so. Now, for my encounter. So on one of those nights, we were in the kitchen. My mom was making something to eat and I was sitting and the dinner table staring outside the kitchen window. The house we lived in sat on a large incline that overlooked the town area and I was looking at the lights from the city. Right outside of the house near this window was a large oak tree that was close to our house, with its branches being above the window about 10-30 feet away. It was dark, so you couldn't see anything else but the distant lights. So as I was sitting there, staring at the town lights, something red appeared in the peripheral corner of my eye. I had thought it was another city light, so my vision slowly wandered over until I was looking directly at it. One singular, glowing eye, sort of reptilian in shape, from my memory it's not exactly like how Mothman is usually described. I sort of remember a slit pupil like a lizard, but more luminous. I don't remember seeing another red eye, but it may have been obstructed by leaves or branches. I sat there kind of daydreaming a bit, not totally comprehending what I was seeing. Then it blinked, it blinked. I remember backing away from the table saying, oh no, please no, and telling my mom there was something outside of the window. She looked and saw it, but didn't immediately panic like I did. Honestly, this night might have been worse than the first. No, actually, I think it was because I saw it. We went up into the bedroom and were just kind of sitting there, clueless on what to do. My mom resorted back to her manic behavior and basically stayed praying over me until I fell asleep. She was still doing it when I woke up. Then we got into my mom's van and left. What happened next was super stressful, to the point where I just wanted to die. For the next day or two, my mother would drive us around aimlessly in her van. She didn't have any direction or destination, she just drove crazed out of her mind. We would occasionally stop back at our grandmother's house in the daytime, but we wouldn't stay there at night. At some point, a mattress was brought into the back of her van for me to sleep on. I think we stayed in a lighted parking lot the night when I fell asleep. When I woke up, she was still driving around. I hated and pleaded and begged for her to let us just go back home, even though I was also scared about returning. After much coercion and persuasion, I eventually talked her into going back to our grandmother's house so I could sleep in a comfortable bed. I was still just a kid and was really tired of this bullshit. She was so paranoid and panicked that when we came back, she didn't let me eat the food she had previously made, even though it was perfectly fine. I was hungry and to this day I hate letting any food go to waste. I had a collection of stuffed animals that meant a lot to me. As memorabilia, she put them all in a black trash bag. I found them, but she still wouldn't let me have them. I think she burned them because she was burning a bunch of other stuff because of her out of control manic mental state. God, I hated that she did that. This hurt me a lot. I loved those things. She ended up putting multiple cross statues and Jesus pictures across the house as well as outside on the porch on the oak tree. Even put some cross symbols on doors around the house. You know, this is actually kind of painful to remember now, even though it's so far back and removed. Like, mentally painful. One other odd thing that happened though, while she was burning things, my grandmother gave my mom this old Bible-looking book for some reason. This just wasn't any old Bible either, it had a hard leather covering with some sort of carving on the cover. This Bible was in a language I did not know, but used the English alphabet characters. It had old-looking black and white images that looked medieval in style, though I can't remember what they depicted. Probably some disturbing medieval art. My mom burned it. For the longest time, I was perplexed about what this book was, what it meant to my grandma. Was it truly a cursed and evil item that needed to be destroyed? I spent some time searching for clues and found what looks almost exactly like the Bible my mom burned. 
I can't remember if this was exactly what this Bible looked like, but it's pretty damn close. Does anyone here know anything about this Bible? I also read that it might be Lutheran. Eventually, we found a place to stay with one of my mom's friends in her basement, stayed there for a week or two, and then eventually a shelter for abused women. It did work out, though, since we received some help after that and found a place in Ohio where we could live. This incident became a thing we were able to eventually leave in the past and get over, but occasionally we do bring it up and talk about it since. At first, it was hard because she would not talk about it at all, but later on, we were able to discuss it, and I got her to tell me what she saw outside our cabin in Wisconsin. What she said she saw were two red lights about 5,100 feet away from our cottage. She showed me how it was moving, whatever it was, not erratically, but keeping its distance. Behind our cottage was this heavily forested area. This thing was about 5,100 feet away from our cottage in this forested area. Mom physically showed how it is sort of getting closer to the cottage, though it was still a considerable distance away. The two red lights never got close, or at least close enough for her to describe any features other than those two red lights. She would not let me come down from the loft to check out why she was panicking and what was happening. She had called the police and said that she had heard banging on the side of our cottage because she knew that was more believable than if she were to describe what she was seeing. She had a knife the whole time before the cops came. As soon as the cop car arrived, she said whatever this thing was looked over at the police lights coming through, turned around and took off running near a dilapidated barn that was located near where this thing was, further back into the forest. I never had a glimpse of this thing in Wisconsin. At first, she chalked it up to somebody with red goggles stalking us, or maybe playing a prank. She was surprisingly skeptical about it being something like a cryptid. However, this argument doesn't really hold up, because during our first encounter in Wisconsin, it was late at night during winter. It was extremely cold up where we lived, and especially since we lived right next to a great lake. I don't think anybody would have been out there to play a prank like that or try and spy on us through a small window in our cottage. Now, this is where a strange little discrepancy pops up. Sometime after the first encounter of this thing in Wisconsin, we again had an encounter with a red glowing eyed being right outside of our grandmother's house, which we had lived for many years secure and without paranormal incident. This to me suggests that this may have been the same entity in both encounters. So how did it travel such a distance? Why did it travel across many hundreds of miles just to harass us? It has no logic. Such a feat makes me believe that whatever we encountered was not a normal physical being. Bound by laws of physicality and traversing such distances really would not be a problem for it. There's also the subject of what this really was. For many years, the only explanation that I could come up with is that it was an actual, real demon. Since this incident, it has popped up into my mind occasionally. Sometimes I would just happen to click myself into the paranormal side of YouTube where they talk about cryptids and supernatural happenings and phenomena. This piqued my curiosity, and I began doing some online research, comparing other people's encounters and descriptions of various kinds to my own. I have since read, heard, and listened to other people's encounters with beings that also have glowing red eyes. This actually appears to be a common phenomena that comes up in such encounters. There are a few Bigfoot sightings which some are reported to have red eyes. Both the Mothman and the Flatwoods monster were described with red glowing eyes. I have read of one or two alien encounters where they had red eyes and apparently dogmen are often reported as having glowing red eyes as well, though not all. This is definitely a supernatural phenomenon, and one that inspires fear. I would go back and forth in my mind trying to figure out which cryptid this could have been. I did not see the whole body, thank God. If I saw a giant werewolf-looking thing with murder eyes and a tree outside my soul would have jumped out of my body. I have heard many other people on the DME podcast describe them with red eyes, and there was one episode in particular that reminded me of my own encounter, 
Only the guy could see the full body. He said it was also in a tree. Then there was the location. I think where I lived was not too far off from Bray Road, where the infamous beast of Bray Road was reported. That one had red eyes. I honestly don't have too much else to compare, but if anything would be living out in that forest, walking around in Antarctic winds and deep snow without a problem, it would probably be one of these beasts. I apologize that this post was so long and probably includes some unnecessary details. I originally just wanted to post my encounters with this thing that harassed us. It's just that I have never told anybody about this entire ordeal. This chapter of my life, mostly bound by paranoia coming from my mom. It almost feels kind of good to get off my chest, cathartic to type this out. To this day, that shit still sticks with me. Also, sorry if this post seems a bit unorganized and chaotic. I stayed up over an hour typing this out and haven't proofread it because I got tired and wanted to get it out before I fell asleep. If anybody is interested in hearing more about this or wants to offer any advice or explanations or anything, please feel free to comment. I hope somebody finds this interesting and I am hoping for the best feedback. Thank you for reading. Hello everyone. I live in rural southwest Virginia in Appalachia and heard odd whistling in the woods a few days ago at night. It started when I was playing airsoft alone in the woods at about 7 p.m. In almost pitch black I live a lonely existence and was walking around the woods behind my house. I got to a clearing just on top of a hill and sat down to take a rest. Just when I sat down I heard odd whistling. It was perfect whistling, and it whistled a tune I had never heard before. It was clear, and it sounded close, within 150 feet or less, and came directly from behind me. It would have had to be in the woods, near the property line with one of our neighbors. It instantly gave me chills down my back, and I got the feeling of being watched. I, not being an idiot and having a brain, wasted no time in sprinting full speed down towards my house hopping over rocks and limbs. The whistling stopped shortly after I got moving, but I still felt like I was being watched and like something was off. I didn't see anything when I did turn back to look while opening a gate, but that may be because of the darkness and the distance I had moved. I don't think it was a bird, as the leaves on the trees haven't regrown yet, and it still stays cold at night and sometimes during the day, but I don't know much about birds. There were also no birds to be seen and everything else was quite I also doubt it was a person, as I heard no talking, no leaves crunching, and no other noises. I should also mention the whistling started out of nowhere and did not gradually get louder as if someone or something was moving closer while whistling. I should also mention that I've been in those woods a decent amount of my life and have never heard anything like it before, not even once. I was a bit tired but I've been more tired before while being up in those woods at similar times before, and I'm not one to hallucinate. The situation still gives me chills when I think about it. I've had the feeling of being watched before in those woods, but those feelings have never been so intense and extreme as that one night. I was hoping if anyone could know what it was. Was it an animal? Maybe, but we, me, and my family have dogs around the house, and most wild animals stay away, and I haven't really seen anything outside of a bear or two and deer in those woods. I should also mention the dogs occasionally bark randomly into the woods, but they weren't really barking at the moment when the whistling happened. I was hoping anyone could identify what it was maybe, if there is even enough information, and I'm not saying it was paranormal, but I'm not saying it was just a wild animal. Also, apologies for typing so much, I just want to make sure all the details are included. My father's sighting. We were living in northern part of the Mitten, the main part of Michigan back in the 80s. One evening I saw a herd of deer running across the field and into the woods. I had also heard a howl of a wolf. I wasn't too interested, but I knew Dad liked being a wildlife spotter, so I went in and told him that I think the deer were spooked by a wolf pack. 
Dad got up, grabbed the binoculars off the table by the door, and went out. I sat down and started watching my Friday night shows, thinking nothing of it. Then the door slammed, and I heard Day holler at Mom. It stood up, it stood up, ran to their bedroom, and came out loading the shotgun and stood by the door. Mom told me to go downstairs to the finished basement and watch my TV down there. Dad spent the night in a chair in the living room. The gun was never put back in his gun cabinet. The next day I asked what was wrong since he was still looking out the front window. He didn't say. Said he didn't want to scare me. Not that it helped because at the age of nine I was imagining all sorts of horrors. He passed last year and I was going through his things with Mom and I saw this folder with Werewolf on it. Inside he had handwritten notes and a few pictures he took. The pictures didn't show anything interesting, but one showed a six-foot hay roll and his notes said that it stood taller than the roll. Other pictures showed the churned dirt from a herd of deer running flat out. I'm not totally convinced that he saw something like the dogman, but something scared him. He never used to hunt with friends during deer season, but after that it was always him and his buddies. Sorry if this isn't too exciting, and for the fact that it's secondhand, I was too into the Dukes of Hazard when it happened to give a care. I was walking from my boyfriend's house last night a bit after midnight. I've known him for six years, so I go there all the time and never felt anything like this. His estate is surrounded by woods on one side and few houses are sprinkled here and there. The path I take to my house is overlooking a hill and the woods are to my back. The entire walk takes maybe five minutes. As I was walking, I was fumbling through my pockets to find my airpods when a sudden feeling of dread overwhelmed me. This came out of nowhere and caught me by surprise, but I was suddenly paralyzed with fear that I contemplated calling him to come and get me, but I couldn't force myself to wait or make any noise. I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but I could feel tears come and I started running. As I was approaching a clearance, I felt that the air is so thick and quiet and everything just felt off. I've been walking this same path for the past six years and never felt anything like this. To clarify, we're in Ireland, relatively safe city, and there are no large animals or predators in the area. Not sure if this even belongs here, but I would like to hear your thoughts. I still feel super uneasy and uncomfortable about this. Thanks, edit. Thanks for everyone chiming in. In hindsight, walking at night with AirPods was very stupid, and I was definitely lulled into a false sense of security, living in a relatively safe city and a neighborhood where rarely anything happens. I should also probably add that I'm an immigrant, and despite living in Ireland for almost a decade, I don't know much about fairies. In any case, I'm glad nothing bad happened, but this definitely shook me enough that I will start being more careful when walking alone. I sure someone mentioned the gift of fear which I added to my Kindle. Think my childhood friends saw a dogman. When I was a kid, my two closest friends just happened to live right next to each other in the eastern countryside of my town. One of them told me he woke up to go to the bathroom or something and said he saw a pair of yellow glowing eyes staring in at him. When I stayed the night with him one night, I questioned him about it, and he was so terrified that I brought it up that he tried to go sleep with his mom. I eavesdropped, and he told her he was scared that the yellow eyes were going to come back. His neighbor, my other friend, was staying the night with me at one night. He told me about this huge black dog that he saw in the back of his pasture where their horses were during the day. He said it was about the size of a horse and on all fours. He really emphasized how large it was, which is the main thing upset him. Not far from this road, there is a very old graveyard that locals claim is an old Indian graveyard. It has gravestones dating back to the 1-800s. I've had three very unusual experiences there that tie into some of the dogman folklore I've learned about, like hearing a howl so loud and deep that it reverberated through my friend and I, 
and both of us took of running towards the car in a fight or flight response. I had a fourth paranormal experience there, but it wasn't dogman related. The town east of Claremore called Pryor Creek also has a dogman encounter on YouTube. Large predators have very large territories, so I wonder if we have a dogman prowling the area living here. It would not be impossible given the amount of farmland, woods, and rural expansions of land here. Our nearby city, Tulsa, also has a few published sightings. Just been connecting the dots. I have a question. So this happens every year at the same time of year. I live in Kentucky, and where I live is a subdivision, but we live towards the back next to miles of woods. Every fall, it's the same thing. Anytime you get home after dark, you feel like you're being watched. And not like a normal being watched. It's the most ominous feeling. Everyone in my household has experienced the same thing. You can feel where it's coming from, and it's always from the wood line. Also, we have heard a lot of noises, and I have been a Kentucky native my whole life. I know what the normal animals around sound like, and it's not that. My fiancé and I have even seen figures of different sizes, never close enough to make out a lot of details either. As well as, and these are her words, it sounded like something trying to sound like a dog, but it was diluted or even almost robotic. What are we dealing with here? So I'm 40 now, but this happened almost 20 years ago. I was born and raised in the Florida Panhandle, and that's where this happened. It occurred on Quintet Road, right at the bridge, crossing the Escambia River on the west side of the bridge. It was around 2.30 a.m. The area is more built up now, but back then it was just a long road with no street lights. If you look it up on Google Earth, there is a wildlife management area, and the river runs all the way to Pensacola Bay going south. Additionally, if you look on the map, the heavily wooded area around the river runs all the way north to Georgia and Florida National Forest. As I was coming down the road heading west, I saw something on the driver's side of the road in the distance. I had no idea what it was. It looked like an animal of some sort. As I got closer, I didn't want to hit it if it tried to cross, so I stopped about 100 feet away from it. When I stopped, it started to move on all fours diagonally across. But as I was looking at this thing, I was in shock at how large it was, and it was oddly colored for any animal in the area. There are black bears in the area, but this was much larger, and its fur was a dark dingy gray color. As it crossed the road to my passenger side, it stood up, and I have never experienced this level of emotion ever. It was like a primal type of fear or shock. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but I knew I stood no chance against this thing if it decided to attack, and it was just standing there looking at me. I was frozen because I was looking at a werewolf. It had to be at least seven feet tall, 600 pound plus, with glowing orange slash yellow eyes. When it disappeared into the tree line, I stomped and got away from where it was as fast as I could. I didn't talk about my encounter for several years and finally started talking about it. I looked and looked, and the dogman is the only thing it could possibly be that I could find. Was it a dogman? I've been posting here about an ongoing situation about some property my family owned. Basically, Moo Grandparents' old house is 20 acres in a large suburban neighborhood, more than half of it forested. A few months ago, I noticed all the deer had fled, not one to be seen. The animals were much quieter than usual, and I barely saw any apart from turkeys, reduced in population and creeping quietly under the hedge geoes, and who dashed away as soon as they saw me unusual. I knew something strange was going on at the property. But the thing that convinced me it was otherworldly was a deer pelt lying in the front lawn. It looked freshly skinned with a meat still on it. Around it, for nearly ten feet, were scatterings of white and black deer under fur in large circular motions, almost like someone forming an S.O. symbol. 
I thought the chances were slim that it just was some flap of skin that fluttered away from a coyote kill. It seemed like a message. I'm here, stay out if you know what's good for you. I felt scared at first, but then just felt sort of meh about it. Maybe there was a mysterious monster, but if I kept away from that property religiously, I probably would be okay. Besides, I had bigger things to think about. So I stayed away from it for more than a month and didn't have too much happen. Sometimes weird things would, like a dead squirrel or the cleanly cut antler of a stag appearing on my running route. Finally, I noticed a few dried sage leaves randomly outside my backyard shed. I don't grow sage and I'm not sure where it came from. It smelled awfully good. Lately I've been over to the property and it seems much less intense. Turkeys and squirrels are much more visible. Do you think anything weird happened? A Bigfoot? A Dogman? I'm in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota by the way. Thoughts? I was talking to a girl I met last night super late on the phone, and we started talking about the outdoors. She asked me what I feared, and I told her I don't fear many animals, but there are crazy things out there. I explained to her Sasquatch and Dogman. She then proceeded to tell me about an experience she had two months ago. She was out in her backyard at about 1 a.m. letting her dog out when something screamed at her three intense og og og. She froze, and after a second, she was able to regain control and ran to her house. As she was getting close to her door, the side motion sensor light turned on, right from the direction of the creature screaming. It then proceeded to do a big huff and then screamed again. She said it was the most intense fear she's ever experienced. Then I started trying to find audio of Dogman's screams. She said it was more of a scream and not a howl. She's an outdoors woman and she knows cougar screams and this was much more intense and fear inspiring. She chalked it up to being a skinwalker. I used to be able to find a couple of decent Dogman screams on YouTube and now I can't find many. Does anyone have a good site or place for audio recordings? A few years ago, I wanted to sell one of my Kawasaki motorbikes because I needed some extra money. The bike was still worth around three to four thousand dollars at that time, even though it had been used for a few years and had many miles on it. Luckily, there were lots of bike enthusiasts all over the state where I lived. First, I tried posting about the bike in some groups, but the offers I received were very low, and I didn't want to accept them. Then I had an idea to put an ad on Craigslist. Surprisingly, it turned out to be a success, and within just 10 minutes of posting the ad, multiple people replied, showing interest in buying the bike. Sadly, the pictures I took of the bike weren't great, as I used my phone, and some were taken in a funny way that made the ad look unprofessional. But I made sure to clean up the bike, and I want to remind everyone that I took good care of it, and it was in good condition. I knew the bike's true value, and I was confident that I could get the right price for it. Now the challenge was to sort through the potential buyers who wanted to see the bike and make an offer. It's always tough to figure out who is serious about buying and who just wants to get a really cheap deal to sell the bike for a higher price later. In this situation, I only replied to the messages from interested buyers, and it was overwhelming. My Craigslist had received hundreds of replies in just a day or two, and my phone kept buzzing constantly. It became too much to handle, and I thought about ending the ad but I decided to keep going and started going through each message one by one. To make it easier, I used a copy and paste reply saying, Thank you for contacting me about the bike. I'm asking for this price, and are you willing to agree to this offer? Most people replied back, but the majority of them tried to negotiate for a lower price. Out of the 500 replies, about 10 to 20 seemed like serious buyers. People were interested in buying the bike at the full price, but they all had one thing in common. They wanted to see it first. It made sense because you wouldn't want to buy something without checking it out, 
especially if it's not from a trusted seller or dealer. There could be potential issues or something shady going on. So I started setting up meetings with interested buyers to see the bike. The first person, let's call him John, was in his early 50s and looked like a typical biker. Interestingly, he arrived on a Harley, which was quite different from my Kawasaki bike. At that time, most people riding Kawasaki bikes were young folks who enjoyed speed, while Harley riders tended to be older bikers. But this man, John, was different. He showed interest in the bike, even mentioning that he wanted to buy it for his younger son who was getting into biking. I thought it was a cool idea, but when it came down to the price, John wasn't willing to pay the full amount I asked for. I couldn't budge on the price because I had so many other potential buyers waiting to see the bike. I had set a plan with a specific amount, and I wanted to stick to it. Before putting up the ad, so John left without making a deal. The next potential buyer who came to see the bike was named Graham. He was in his early 20s and had just started getting into biking, or at least that's what he told me. Graham said he had been saving up money from his job to buy a bike, and the 400 cubic centimeters Kawasaki seemed perfect for him. It had enough power for his needs, but not too much that it would be overwhelming for a beginner like him. Graham claimed he had recently obtained his biking license and was really excited about buying this bike. I told him firmly that the price was not negotiable, it was fixed. However, I did allow him to come and take a look at the bike if he was genuinely interested. On Tuesday evening during springtime, around 5.36 p.m., Graham came to see the bike right after finishing his work shift. He parked his car in our driveway and got out. Graham was dressed in jeans and a polo shirt that seemed like a uniform from a retail job, probably for customer service. He greeted me with a handshake and introduced himself. We started chatting and made some small talk as people usually do in such situations. But while we were talking about bikes and how great it would be for Graham to start biking, he started inspecting the bike like a pro, even though he had admitted to never riding one before. The surprising thing was that he looked at everything, I mean absolutely everything. He opened the tank, checked the brakes, and even examined the disc brakes and pads closely. Then he went to the back and used the light to look inside the exhaust. It was quite awkward to continue our small talk while he was busy checking out the bike so thoroughly. Finally, after all that inspection, he made an offer that was more than $1,500 below the price I had asked for. Not only did this enrage me and make me annoyed, but it made me realize I had just wasted my time, and this man had ignored my request of no offers. I allowed him to come round and look at the whole bike and fiddle with it like he was some kind of an expert, and after all that, he comes up with the excuse that the brakes are worn. Now, number one, I knew for certain they weren't worn, as I had just had this bike fully serviced at the local bike dealer only a week before selling this. That was the reason why I had it serviced, so that I could sell it with peace of mind. And having that as evidence, I ran into the house and grabbed the service document with proof saying who serviced it, what they did, what they checked, and nowhere on that form did it say anything about brake pads or brake discs being worn. He seemed to think otherwise, and even though he admitted he was an absolute newbie when it came to biking, he thought that the brake discs were worn, and that somehow they had been worn down very low. I knew deep down this is absolute nonsense, but that was his way of justifying such a low offer. I looked him straight in the eye and said, No low offers. There's nothing wrong with this bike, and if you're not willing to pay the full asking price, then leave immediately. Something switched in this man's eyes. He went from being the happy beginner biker checking over my bike to almost looking like a psychopath. Now his eyes began to dilate, and he stared at me with a frown that could kill a thousand children. I couldn't believe what was happening. Graham didn't say a word, just stared at me with a blank expression. It made me feel uneasy and unsure of what to do. I was alone as my wife was inside watching TV. 
With a firm voice, I told him to leave, trying to sound confident, even though I was uncertain about his intentions. I worried that he might act crazy or become aggressive. Thankfully, he turned around without saying anything, walked back to his car, and drove away. The whole encounter was incredibly awkward, and I couldn't understand why he behaved that way. It left me feeling quite uneasy and puzzled. The brakes were clearly not worn, as I'd had them checked by professionals. But this guy, Graham, seemed to make up some strange excuse to lower the price by a huge amount, which was not fair at all. The bike was priced reasonably, and I didn't want to be taken advantage of. So I had to start the process all over again and go through more potential buyers who wanted to see the bike. Many of them were still offering very low amounts. But then I came across another offer from a guy named Reese. He was willing to offer only $200 less than the asking price and still wanted to take a look at the bike. Reese told me that he wanted to show the bike to someone else in a different state. He asked me to meet him halfway, and since I had a truck and had transported the bike before, I agreed. We decided to meet at a Walmart parking lot about a hundred miles away. The drive was quite long, almost an hour. When I finally reached the Walmart parking lot, I couldn't believe what I saw. It wasn't Reese waiting for me. It was the same guy Graham whom I had met before. I was shocked and couldn't believe this was happening. When I saw that it was the same creepy guy Graham with his unsettling eyes, I felt a sense of danger. I decided not to stop the truck and continued driving around to assess the situation. He was waving me over, but I couldn't trust him, even though he claimed to be willing to pay the full price that day. I didn't take any chances because I didn't know what he was planning. There was something fishy about him wanting to meet me at that nearly empty Walmart parking lot late in the evening after he supposedly finished work. He had lied about living in another state and even used a different name to act like a different buyer. This whole situation seemed really suspicious and I didn't want to put myself in a risky position. So I kept driving and didn't stop the truck. He tricked me into driving almost an hour across the state to meet him, pretending to be someone else, but I didn't fall for it. I knew something wasn't right, so I didn't stop the truck when I saw him at the Walmart parking lot. Instead, I quickly turned around and drove back the way I came. I felt relieved that I didn't stop because it could have been dangerous. I wonder what he had in mind if I had gone out of the truck and met him again. He seemed really crazy, and I'm glad I trusted my instincts and got out of there. My sis and I were on the subject of the guy in my hometown that went on a short killing spree, and she brought this story up I told when it happened. About eight years ago, I stayed downtown. Back then, if you remember, Craigslist had a personal section. I never really dabbled in that, but being curious I did, so I made an ad nothing spectacular and waited. Not much went down, just some scammers and bots, married people, etc. I get this one message from a young woman telling me how I sound interesting and would love to get to know me more. We exchanged pics. She exchanged an older pic, but she looked pretty cute in it. Had a bright smile and big blue eyes. She was nice, I just wasn't feeling her like that. She was 18 and I was 24 at the time, but also she was seven months pregnant. We enjoyed conversations for a few days and we decided to link. She didn't stay far from me. She stayed more on the northeast side, just on the edge of downtown. This day it was a festival going on. I asked if she wanted to go, but she couldn't because her legs were tired and kind of sore so I agreed to meet her at her place. She stayed in a northern slum. Not ghetto, but slum. The house was big, but also you could tell off bat that it was used as an apartment. Wasn't an appealing house, but there weren't many other appealing ones either. When I told her I'm outside, I see her come on the front porch. She was a small thing, all of about five foot zero tall, white with dark hair. Couldn't be no more than 90, 110 pounds, and that was because of the pregnancy. Her baby bump was very noticeable. 
She had a small chocolate Labrador puppy with her. They both were happy to see me. When I got close to her, I was surprised. She didn't have the same bright smile I saw in her pics. Her teeth were gray and her face looked like someone who was into heavy drugs. Her eyes still had light to them. But overall, she looked like a tired human being and not in the fatigued sense. I gave her a hug, made sure to watch my strength. We went into the place. There wasn't nothing sketchy about it. It stunk, like animals and weed. We went upstairs and I saw a black couple up there. They shut their door and it seemed like they were arguing. All the rooms upstairs seemed small and the ceilings were slanted. Her room was fitted pretty nice. She was a smoker, I smelled the ashtray stench. We decided to watch Pineapple Express. That was my first time seeing that movie. She complained about her legs a lot. I seen some little swelling on them, so I gave her legs a rub. I used her body lotion. She loved it a lot and appreciated it big time. We talked, and it was getting late, and I wanted to head out to downtown and catch the heat of the festivities. She looked like she enjoyed my company a lot, and as we were waving goodbye for some reason, I just said to myself, Ma'am, that chick seems troubled. I thought of burning sage when I got home. Like two days later, she hit me up saying her ex-boyfriend got kicked out of his place and he needed somewhere to stay. So me and her hanging out couldn't happen again, which I didn't care, I just told her I understood and make sure she's safe. I left to Chicago to spend time with family. I came back a week later, and after getting my hair retwisted, I saw a realty sign with her last name on it when I was out for a walk. She had a unique last name. I decided to check on her. I sent her an email. No response. About five minutes later, I opened up Facebook, and as I scrolled, I stopped immediately because I saw the very picture she first sent me. I'm like, why the hell is that pic on here? I click a link saying there was a triple homicide. I sat on the curb and was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I read the details and was shocked. She met a guy on Craigslist for sex. Her ex met up with him too, supposedly. He killed the ex-boyfriend and decapitated him. Left his body at a park I was familiar with. He took her and held her captive in his basement. He tortured her for a week. What made me so pissed was that he went to a sports bar down the street from me and told the bartenders how he is someone locked up in his basement right now. Nobody took it serious to call the police. That probably could have saved her. He strangled her and stuffed her in a suitcase. By then the police figured him out and he was on the run. When they stopped his car, he decided to take himself out. They found him probably because of the emails from Craigslist. I know they investigated my email. I deleted it immediately once I took all this in. About a month later, I was on Craigslist and I saw in the miscellaneous section about meeting scammers and such. I posted a reply about people being careful and I posted her story. Also around then I had a guy I went to HS with who got caught robbing people for money on there. When I summarized her story, I get a reply. It was from a lady demanding to know what I know. Come to find out it was her aunt. When I told her she wanted to talk on the phone, so I did. I gave her my condolences and told her about the time we spent together. She told me her ex was pimping her out. Her life never was like that. Her parents were good people and confused that she took that path in life. That girl was just a baby. I've been around death before, but nothing like that because what if I kept hanging with her? The crazier parts are the guy had another woman in his place, but she escaped. She was living with him and he made her a sex slave. But also he was supposed to fly to Vegas to meet a lady for from a fetish site. But there were complications on his end. The day he committed the murder, he contacted the lady and told her he wanted to meet her ASAP. He was paying for the travel and everything, but she needed his info. She didn't go through with it, but she looked him up and happened to see his connection with a triple homicide. What's even more dark is that they didn't find her ex-boyfriend's head at the park, just his body. They found his head north of the city in 2019. 
like 25 miles away from his dead body. Why did he take that head? What'd he do with it to travel with it like that? The awkward thing is that there was a lady who lived with me a year later after that. Things were complicated and I had to kick her out. She moved into the exact room that Chick was in. I know because I had to come over there to give her something she left. This is also the girl that played a major part in my sister and her ex-boyfriend breaking up for good. People do come into your life for a reason, I suppose. I use Craigslist for business and some social events. But after that, my approach became entirely different, and I became very cautious on who I met. P. S. He unalived himself after the end of the high-speed chase. The cops followed him, and he shot himself. The woman was in the trunk of his car inside a suitcase. I can't remember the exact year, but my nan had passed away, so we had to clean her house, and it was filled with so much stuff. I was around 14 at the time, and my parents were also extremely sad at what had happened, so it was a rather depressing time for me and my sister, who were also dragged along to clear the house out. There were a lot of memories in this house, and we had spent many weekends around our nans. This was a time when she would always care for us and take care when our parents were away or on holidays by themselves. So we began the task of clearing out her house. At the time, it was a rather small house in the rural areas of Oregon. It was surrounded by trees and great oaks and even had a pine forest bordering the border. This was amazing, and we'd often spend most afternoons playing outside in our garden and running through the forests. Our parents would yell at us, though, as we needed to also do our own fair share of the work, and clearing out the house was a mammoth task for only four people. Finally, my dad found a solution for us. Instead of just throwing everything away, he suggested that we should create some ads on websites like Craigslist or eBay to sell some of the stuff online. We kept the most valuable and sentimental antiques for ourselves, things that meant a lot to us, and we wanted to take back to our own house. However, we had to get rid of many other things because we were planning to sell the house in the next week or two. So my dad made a Craigslist ad and put up various items for sale. You won't believe this, but there were around 2,000 items that my dad managed to list by creating separate ads for each one. My mom suggested making one big ad with a brief description of everything for sale, but my dad is a perfectionist. He wanted to pay attention to every small detail, so he spent three or four hours every night listing each item one by one. All his effort paid off because we started getting hundreds of responses from interested buyers. People came to the house to check out the things we were selling. Some items got more attention than others. My nan lived a long life, reaching 102 years old. She lived alone for many decades, even after my grandfather passed away. Back then, my nan had a big collection of antiques, and while many of them didn't have much value, there were some china sets that were really special. They had intricate designs and interesting patterns that caught people's attention. Some folks were really interested in these china sets, and we got a lot of responses. These sets included mugs, knives, spoons, and things with woven and carved metal designs. I'm not exactly sure what to call them, but I'm doing my best to describe them. One day, a strange man came to visit us. I remember him knocking on the door to check out some of the cutlery and china sets. This man who visited had some eye issues, as they seemed to be looking in different directions. As kids, we were a bit scared because we didn't understand why he looked different. Sometimes kids can't help but stare and wonder about things that are unfamiliar. As he came in, I got a bad feeling from him, but my parents seemed unaware of it. They greeted him politely with the usual, Hello, how are you? and directed him towards the china set to check it out. My dad was under a lot of stress during that time, juggling his job and clearing out the house, so he was quite busy. But he made the bad mistake of leaving the man to look at the china set, while he went off and continued to clear boxes from the upstairs. 
My mom was still downstairs with us while my dad was working like a headless chicken, piling things into boxes upstairs. I was sat at the computer, trying to figure out this Craigslist ad and accept more and more offers. I was also doing communications and talking to people and helping them with what they wanted. My sister was sitting on the sofa, but I'm not sure as I can't remember what she was doing at the time, and my mom was in the kitchen. So this guy had quite literally been left alone downstairs with us. I kept glancing over at times, and he was just looking at the cutlery and the china set. He had it very close to his eyes, and he seemed to be paying attention to the fine detail on the patterns. But I don't blame him, as they really were beautiful. Some of them had Chinese-style patterns, and some were even Indian-style cutlery sets, and it was very impressive. Maybe he was just one of those people who had a knack or an interest in those types of individual unique things. Anyway, I continued to scroll through my Craigslist messages on my dad's account when all of a sudden, I heard my mom screaming. I didn't know what was happening, but when someone in your family yells out like that, you feel their pain deeply. I know it's hard to explain, but especially when you're younger, you have a strong connection with your parents, at least that's how I feel. My mom's scream was terrifying, and it made me gasp. My dad heard it too and started running down the stairs, but before he could reach us, I heard loud crashing and banging noises from upstairs. It seemed like he was stumbling over boxes or dropping things while he was still busy clearing out stuff. I looked around and saw my mom in the kitchen. She was pinned against the fridge by the man who had come to see the china set. It was the scariest and most disturbing thing I could ever recall. The man visiting us started trying to take my mom's clothes off, and she fought back. Suddenly, my dad rushed down the stairs and immediately put the man in some kind of hold, taking him down to the floor. My mom was gasping for breath and looked like she might pass out. My dad did a great job restraining the man, and he told me to call 911 right away. I ran to my nan's old phone, which was covered in dust, and dialed 911. I tried my best to explain what was happening, but I was in such shock that my words didn't come out as I planned. It was a really scary and chaotic situation. My younger sister was crying and went upstairs all alone. The whole incident was so frightening that even now, the family still talks about it and remembers what happened. My dad was a real hero as he saved my mom from that awful man who didn't really care about the china sets. He was just trying to harm my mom. It's essential to take care of your family as they mean a lot, and we need to be there for each other. I was selling a guitar on Craigslist as I had more than enough, and this one just didn't get the attention it deserved. Listed it at 600 bucks firm. The guitar was a limited run, Schechter C1 with a Floyd Rose Bridge, a custom camo finish and factory distressed brass hardware. Brand knew the thing listed at over 1K. Figured 600 was a fair price all things considered, especially since it had no dings or scratches. Couldn't even tell the thing was used. A few days after posting it is get a guy texting me about how he'd happily trade for it along with a smaller cash offer. Politely explained that I wasn't looking for trades, and that the price was firm. He decides to go on a rant about how I'm mentally unstable. No one is going to pay that much for such a piece of shit. You're lucky if you get even half the offer I have you. As if 150 bucks with a little practice amp is somehow worth it. Told him thanks for the criticism, but I know what my gear is worth. This lead to five days of relentless texts and emails from this dude. All rage-filled, each more insulting than the last. He texts me again on day six asking if the guitar was still for sale, and if I'd do business with him if he gave me more than what I was asking. As if I'd do business with someone who insulted my knowledge of my gear, my intelligence as a person, and acted like a grade a cock nozzle. So I was driving by myself on a highway in Maine. 
cranking killer tunes, slamming Mountain Dew big gulps, and sucking back American spirit lights, decided to go hog wild at a Taco Bell drive through and ordered an enormous amount of food extra fixins. So I'm devouring the Taco Bell, had a full menu assortment, live mass. Of course, about 40 minutes after I ate, my stomach began seizing and cramping. There was to be no refunds, no returns. Luckily, I see a rest stop coming up in about two miles. I floor it and pull in. It's about 1.30 a.m., and it seems pretty vacant. There's one other vehicle in the lot, windows steamed up. I assume it's just another road tripper who had to pull over to rub one out. We've all been there. No judgment. I get out of my car and run into the men's room. I was holding the bottom of my pants when I ran in because I wasn't sure I was going to make it. Finally, I'm in the stall and it's not a good scene. Figuring I would be in there a while, I brought my smokes and a copy of Mad Magazine I always keep in my car for emergencies like this. I'm working on my fourth American spirit when I hear another person come in. Footsteps stop. I hear him taking deep breaths. I holler out, hey man, I'd keep those breaths shallow. No response. I can see dude's feet right in front of the stall. They're huge. Got to be at least a size 17. Dirty as shit too. I sit in silence staring at these huge shoes. Sudden ass blasts squeeze out and the sound echoes in the empty restroom. All of a sudden guy starts pounding on the door, then grabbing the top and shaking it. I'll be out in a minute, you spaz, I screamed. Then it stops. I hear the footsteps again and then a lot of squeaking. Then footsteps again and the door opening and slamming shut. Of course, there was no toilet paper in the stall and it was not a clean pinch as you can imagine. I had to use my mad magazine. Alfred E. Newman has never been so disrespected. I exit the stall and see in marker written on the mirror, see you outside, and it was signed Nitro. I'm born and bred in Maine. I've met a lot of guys who go by Nitro. Not a one do I want to meet alone at a rest stop in the middle of nowhere. I'm terrified. I hatch a plan that I am just going to go for it. I open the restroom's door and sprint to my car. Not looking back, I just run. I hear a shuffle and footsteps behind me. Ugh, I hear behind me. I left my car unlocked because it's a piece of shit and I get right in. I get the car going and do a bit of a burnout and speed off. I see in my rear view mirror the silhouette of a massive man. He threw his hat on the ground and began jumping up and down as I sped down the highway. No idea what this guy's intentions were. But this was easily a top five scary moment for me. And I can't really bring myself to poop in a public restroom since. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.